How is it all right out in that room? Pretty early to get on the verbal level. I was telling somebody that I haven't been on this campus since 1929. I don't think anybody around here that old. I was thinking about going to university at that time. I just finished high school. The depression was on. The stock market had just crashed. I couldn't get a job in Los Angeles. I parked cars out here near the USC. That's going to work or not. Anybody know how to make this thing stay? Let's see, do we have a full house? Are you, uh, are you arranged so you can see the blackboard? Because I'm sort of a chalk man. I wonder if. We could pull the other Davenport in or something, get you chaps more comfortable place. Or pull this one out. Just pull it out and swing it in front here, maybe, huh? Just bring that one around here, dude. I don't. Here's another comfortable chair for somebody. Somebody like to get a little closer. Well, as I sometimes attempt to do is play roughly two roles in my presentations. One is to act as a, I used to think I was a, a translator of the large scene in the world because I was a philosophy major in the old days. And then I hung around formal schooling <clears throat> for 27 years. I don't know if anybody's put in that many years in school <clears throat> before I got my doctor's degree. <clears throat> but I can tell you that I hated school from the first grade through the 27th year. <laughs> so I think, I don't know, maybe I'm a masochist or something, but I put in a lot of years, couldn't stand school. And when I get, a, I'm, I got a kind of a conditioning to camp I. It just reminds me of the of that drudge, and I never had was very good at memorizing things, which seems to be most of education. I'm sympathetic with the kids who try to get educational reform because when I was at least in graduate school, I thought that eighty percent of the stuff I took was sheer junk. And I had to get all sorts of special privilege to get into the courses that, that I thought were relevant to my particular interest, which was behavioral science. And it was pretty infant as a science in those days. But I guess you can, you can pick and choose your courses now, can't you, better, if you want to cross departmental lines and so on. When I did this 25 years ago, it was considered very far out and daring, and I only got away with it because I happened to know some, some people who were the heads of departments and that sort of thing. So I could dip into the medical school and take some courses, and social welfare school and take some more, and so on. But that, I guess that's common stuff now. 
But even so, I guess there's a lot of stuff you're taking at school that's not very relevant. But uh, what kind of things did you have to do to uh, get to be what you people are? Just get a degree, hang around the campus for a while, <laughs> know some right people. Uh, that's sort of the way it was. You had to be a little bit innovative, I suppose, but not not too much. <coughs> now you look pretty far out with that hairdo. Your hair is getting about as long as mine. And the beard's a little far out. Did they, you grew the beard since you've been working here, I suppose. Because they wouldn't hire you if you had the beard to begin with, would they? Because <laughs> you look like a fairly traditional looking bunch of people. And I see you're properly desegregated. We have one black. That it? That makes it all right to have one black, huh? I don't see any other sort of Auslanders here, except you. Most of you look like that. You're pretty far out with that beard. <laughs> The models, have they been distributed? Or he hasn't, he hasn't arrived yet? I think I'm kind of vamping till ready, because I'd like to uh, have you see some models to take notes. Or How many have heard this quote? If the human race is to survive, it will have to change its ways of thinking more in the next 25 years than it has done in the last 25,000. As some people are saying, we're going through a, a more profound revolution at the present moment than we ever have. The Copernican revolution took several hundred years before people kind of got the word. And we're going through more profound revolutionary changes in a decade than we have in hundreds of years previously. I suppose it's communications media that's got us kicked off these ways. But what I attempt to do a little bit is to draw some pictures to describe the range of sophistication we are, thinking it might be useful to sort of get a, an overview. One of the models I borrowed from my friend Sam Bois, who lives down here. How many know Sam Bois? Well, that's surprising. He just lives around the street here someplace nearby. J.S. Bois? Nobody knows J.S. Bois? <coughs> Doesn't mean anything? How many of you know about Alfred Korsibsky? Nobody knows Alfred Korsibsky? <coughs> um, what were your major fields of information gathering? What did you get your degree in? I have a degree in philosophy. Philosophy. Never heard of Alfred Korsibsky? <laughs> How about you? Uh, hotel management. Hotel management. Not much philosophy there. Huh? <laughs> Lots of psychology. Is this all business sort of oriented stuff? What about you? Uh, you Chinese came up history. Chinese history. <laughs> Well, we have to have a few peculiar people around. <laughs> well, one of the models that I borrowed from Sam Bois was picked up from Alfred Korsibsky. Alfred Korsibsky was a Polish mathematician that uh, wrote a book called Manhood of Humanity and where he introduced his time-binding theory. And he made these kind of interesting generalizations. He said, the planet is composed of roughly three, three major classes, the energy binders, the space binders, and the time binders. The energy binders are 
made up mostly of the plant class of life that abstract energy from soil and solar processes and bind it. But they're pretty much limited to where the seeds fly and so on. And then he said we have animal class of life, which has some of the characteristics of the vegetable class. But in addition, they ingest an abstract from the vegetable class and then can move around. He calls those the space binders. Then he said we have another distinct, unique class of life called the human class of life, which are the symbolic class of life. We can do what the animals do, and we have some of the vegetable characteristics, but we have that additional characteristic, the time-binding capacity, which means we have produced and are influenced by a symbolic world. And most of my stuff is what I call a study of neural symbolic processes. You, as a bag of protoplasm, have accumulated a lot of symbolic stuff, you with your Chinese hang-up, and so on, and she's got another kind of collection and I've got another kind of collection, but we're all victims of our own symbolic patrimony. Like I happen to be a birthright Quaker, and I think it's the only way to fly. Any other Quakers in the house? No friends here, huh? Are we ready, Professor? I'm ready. <coughs> Thank you. This is a pass up that you want. And these are individual ancient orders. Oh, good. Passed around. Yes. There are three pages of models. The one that I've just put on the blackboard here will be on page one. So if everybody would have that. Page two looks like this. It has a, has a psychogram on it. If you recognize a psychogram, Cartesian coordinate. And that's page three, which is what we call a sanity spectrum. On page three, we have a normal distribution curve and then a sensitivity scale. Well, I'll, I'll just go on while you're getting your papers with this model. If you could sort of fill in down the line and think of this as a series of circles, each circle enclosing the inner circle. And then I put the words, uh, people and information, and underneath it I put the word assumptions, what I attempt to do with this model is to develop your awareness in this five-stage model that if you're an individual that's involved, let's say, at stage one with a limited number of people and have a limited amount of information and are a rather naive character, you'll probably have uh, some difficulty understanding people who are involved with a larger number of people and have a larger amount of information and are fairly sophisticated as a human organism, which turns out to be one of the big problems we have. It's the information gap. It's the sophistication gap, whatever you want to call it, that people who are, let's say, involved with this number of people and are fairly sophisticated and informed can understand less sophisticated people, but less sophisticated people can't understand more sophisticated people. And that's what I'd like to spell out a little bit. You're sure we don't have access to another blackboard in the house, huh? Is this, does this take care of the university campus? <laughs> we have others. I can get you that one. 
I wonder if we could have another one. Somebody put in an order for a second one. Bill, are you going to the operations office? It'd be nice to have a little more, because I've already used up the blackboard and I haven't started. Well, I was trying to talk about Alfred Korzybski before I put my model up here, too, and his time-binding theory, and mis mostly what we're talking about today will be what I call stage four, the study of neurosymbolic processes. Try to get you aware of the, when we study neurosymbolic processes, we try to understand how come we don't uh, communicate and relate very effectively. I think these have been around. You didn't get any models? That's page three. Where are the other models left over? Could we? Okay. But Korsibsky, the fellow I mentioned who talked about the human organism as a time binding class of life. Maintain that because we're time binders or symbolic class of life, we have the capacity to communicate and cooperate for our mutual well-being, which is a beautiful theory, but it, most of you know, of course, that it's a lot of rot. That uh, uh, we're the only class of life on the planet that systematically eliminates our own kind. And my feeling is because we're a we're a neurosymbolic class of life. If you've read Simeon's book, The Man's Presumptuous Brain, are you familiar with that book? Where you describe this, the human brain, you see, has this delightful capacity to designate values to things and people. Well, that's, that's dandy. I kick right up, right, take that out of the art department. <laughs> That's great. I think we'll put the model over here. It looks like a good place. Whoop. <laughs> okay. I'll use this area for something else. I'll set this out linearly too. Because I want to put several characteristics on this model, like development. If I'm at stage one as an infant and then get involved with some more people and get some more information, I become a child, then I become a youth, then I become an adult, and maybe even a sophisticated adult. So if I'm an adult, I remember what it was like being a youth and a child and even having remnants of my infancy. So as we say, communication is very difficult up this way but it's almost impossible this way. If I'm a child, I haven't any idea what it's like to be an adult. And this is one of the sad things, you see, we run into, that we can't really give a child predictability. We can't give a youth predictability. I find one of the great frustrations of youth today is that they, they've got all that spit and push and are idealistic and are in the reformer group, lots of activism and push to make the world over, but they haven't very much predictability 
of the difficulty of influencing complex processes. They want to do it now, you know, and it's very difficult to influence very complex processes. If you've watched this institution right where you're sitting, uh, notice how long it takes you to get almost anything accomplished. Uh, any kind of changes you try to bring about, maybe they're very useful, meaningful changes, and you just have to fight City Hall like crazy, and if you come on too strong with your suggestions, why they're going to think you're one of those bad guys, uh, and you have to be subtle and play all sorts of games to get something accomplished. But it's very difficult. And any of you people who've been around for very long in any of these departments notice how difficult it is for even little changes. And this is one of the problems you see, of course, youth with all their enthusiasm, but they don't, uh, they don't have predictability. Well, this, was, this is one way of getting you aware that on, even on a developmental level, the more sophisticated in your development, you can understand less sophisticated in development, but it doesn't go the other way around. And the same thing goes with cultural sophistication on the planet, that we have isolated cultures on the planet. Uh, we call them primitives, if you want a term for them. They're simply isolated cultures. They're involved with no other cultures. They've done very well within themselves for a million years, but uh, they get pretty isolated in their whole bag, their whole system. And when people are isolated and have worked out a system for survival, another man's system that may be equally useful in another area of the planet is a great threat to the one who's already developed his system. Now the brain of the isolated man is n measurably no different from any other brain, at least on a group basis. But their sophistication differences is quite different. For instance, the people at stage one, we call this the sensing stage of man's development. And if you look at it close up, you'll find that the basic assumption about a stage one man is that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between what's going on in the cosmos and or what he's able to record, you see, between the recording and what's going on. Our own primitive forebears watch the sunrise and set, and of course if you watch everything whirling around you, how do you suppose you decode that? We said, of course, we are the center of the cosmos, and when we say that makes sense, we're talking about a stage one assumption. Sense means I'm sensing it through my apparatus. But then there was an additional thing. Once having recorded it with my apparatus and assuming that's what's going on, then I decode it, you see, and say, we're the center of the cosmos. And I'm, I'm too naive to realize that I have translated my sensory apparatus recording, but I'm, I'm assuming that the way I decode it, the way I talk about it, is the same as what's going on. Now we say it now, well, that's kind of a naive way of looking at the cosmos, but you have to recognize, although it's a rather naive way for us on the UCLA campus, there are hundreds of millions of human beings on the planet in 1969, going into 70, in the Christian calendar, that uh, have this belief about the cosmos. And I wonder how many of you, if you're confronted with a stage one man, uh, how you'd communicate with him, if you even could understand his language and he, your language. And you know those people are at the United Nations level, and we have to deal with them every day. And I can tell you it takes a very sophisticated man to communicate and relate meaningfully cooperative behavior with a stage one man. When we got to stage two, we call this the, the pre-science orientation. We call it the classifying stage when we're spelling it out because this was sort of equivalent to the Greek era where we had uh, observed all the orderliness in the cosmos and so we began to classify everything, morals, meanings, and 
what not. And the, the interesting hangover was once you get something classified, you say that's good, or that's fair, or that's just, or that's moral, or that's right. Okay. Somehow, uh, you think you've established some kind of a reality. And that's that f funny brain we have. Once we've said, well, that, don't you think that's fair? Uh, if you've listened to Mr. Agnew recently, uh, he has a nice way of talking with what we call stage two language. He classifies the effete snobs huh? and uh, so on. And then, of course, if you happen to be on his philosophical bias team, what do you say? By God, tell it to him, Spiral. Let him have it, huh? That's telling it like it is. And you say, you sort of jump up and down and say, it's good to see some guy in high quarters being authentic, huh? Calling a spade a spade. But if you don't happen to agree with his philosophical biases, you say, what kind of a nut is this? What an irresponsible character in such high places in government. But if you look close up, you'll find out that whether, whether you're comfortable or uncomfortable with a Spiro Agnew has to do with your philosophical biases. Maybe we better talk about that before we go on. I'd like you to keep in mind that neurosymbolic postulate. See, the study is you as a bag of protoplasm that handles information. We're studying this. That's you. And uh, the symbolic system you've produced. So we study both the organism as an information handling mechanism and the information it gets. But deeper than that, you see, it's the interrelationship between you and your symbolic world. And it's a, it's a time dimension. We have to put it in time. If our technical definition, you see, is a, a fourth dimensional study of the interrelationship between the human organism and its symbolic environment. That's what we call neurolinguistics or neurosemantics, neurosymbolic processes. Not so sure I got that across. Let's get back to uh, give you a, a quickie on on some of the complications that we are. That model at the on page two. The bottom of page two, that's the, that's page three. This is the one, this is page two. The bottom of the page is another model. Looks like this. This is a quick model I'd like to acquaint you with. Just to give you a feeling of this neurosymbolic stuff that we are. We describe you operationally as a, the complicated thing you are, as a thinking, feeling, self-moving, electro-colloidal, electrochemical organism interacting in a space-time environment. That's you with a history. That little model in back is to remind you that you've got a history. And then I superimpose on this model another one that looks like this. It's a little different structure. Because that little thing I've drawn in on the top contains what we call your secondary nature or your collection. And this is what, what we collect determines the way we think and feel and behave. And actually what we get through our nerve endings is determined by this secondary nature, which we might draw in in the background there too. My secondary nature, part of it is made up, for instance, of my standards. I call that my value system. You see, this is the funny about the human organism. We designate a value to something or someone, as I mentioned earlier. I notice here now, the only man in the room 
you see who's not wearing a tie is this one back here trying to study while he's recording this stuff he's probably got some tests coming up you know I got to do a little thing on the side but you see the rest of you are all proper you all have ties do you know what a tie is this is to remind us that we have external genitalia that's all that's all it means and uh, it's a simple thing. <laughs> we really wouldn't have to do that, but that's been a custom to remind people that we carry external genitalia, and so there, we, there it is, you see. The women don't wear ties generally, but some do. You can't tell about some of these women. <laughs> but anyway, notice that we have designated a standard now, a value, that says <clears throat> we wear ties. Now, you'll find that there's a range not only of ties, I mean that we have or have not ties, but then there will be appropriate ties and inappropriate ties. And now you see we're going kind of mod again, and notice that this fellow's got a much bigger tie than I have. If you've ever gone to Brooks Brothers, uh, the Brooks Brothers will tell you that they don't uh, have very wide ones or very narrow ones when they go narrow. They have uh, proper ones. They, you go to Brooks Brothers and they'll tell you what is the right tie. Huh? I love that stage two position. And we call that the stage two position. And that's right. Huh? And if you get away with it, you can sell a lot of ties that way. Especially if you're charging money and making more profit on them. Because, but you'll notice that if you've sort of picked up a tie style and you say, well, I'm comfortable with this tie style, and then somebody brings in something too, too narrow. See, this is too narrow, already obsolete. And, uh, and this is the sort of the coming thing. And by the time that that really is in, there'll be something else going around. Huh? But for me, you see, I, I remember the 20s, and I didn't in the early 30s, and I didn't care for those broad ties, although I went through my wardrobe the other day and picked one out I hadn't worn for 20 years. It looks pretty good. <laughs> anyway, this is, notice that, that we, we have this stuff, though. We're, we're, we're shocked at somebody's tie. Or we're shocked at somebody's shirt. Look at this god-awful thing over here. <laughs> and look at the tie that goes with it. My God, it sort of fits his makeup with hair pulled down in front. See, he's pretty, he's pretty hip. Yeah. He's got most of the good characteristics of a mod man. Looks like a psychedelic breakdown. <laughs> but he looks like he's tough, can take all of the adverse criticism that comes his way, and he probably gets a lot. But that color of that shirt, that gets to me. Now, you see, uh, other people might say, by God, it's good to see a man have, have some little color. And that's a wild tie, and it really fits in with the shirt and the man. You know, beautiful. But notice that these are things we designate. And some people have, uh, have pretty narrow designations. They have what we call finicky brains. Uh, it doesn't take very much of any kind of an event that's atypical about what they get an insult to the organism. Very easily insulted. Traditionalists in general, you see, tend to be sort of, uh, you know, hold back, don't change, and all that sort of stuff. And they, they can't stand very much deviation from the norm. But the point is that I may have a narrow range of values, designations, or I may have a broad range. But it doesn't make a lot of difference, except for the amount, whether it's narrow or broad. If somebody comes on out of your range, the organism is insulted. And notice how we talk when we're insulted. You would say, my God, you don't wear a shirt like that. And he says, God damn it, I wear what I please. <laughs> and you know, we'll start talking about it, maybe. Most people, of course, at least on the campus level, we don't talk about it. We look at it and say, you know, we say something to ourselves. 
<laughs> and we'll do something, the organism's insulted, and we'll give him a funny look. And he'll probably wonder, what the hell's the matter with you? Didn't you have a good breakfast? Or something. And you'll have a little uh, thing go probably quite unwittingly. Or we have black people in here, and some people, I suspect, are uncomfortable having black people around. Some people, you see, where we have just a, a little difference, like the pigmentation range. The reason we have so much trouble with black people, you see, is that there are a lot of places in the globe where originally the black people came from, and then there are other places in the globe which are nearby where people are partially black, you see, and so you have these gradations, the Arabs and, and you know, the Semitic tribes and so on. You have, you have all of these gradations and the engines, uh, gradations of color. But if somebody is not too much different, if you go to Hawaii, I don't know if you've been to Hawaii much, but you know, you go over to Hawaii and everybody gets along pretty well because the gradations aren't very great. Of course, they have a pretty severe pecking order there. The whites peck the Chinese, that peck the Japanese, which peck the Filipinos, and so on down the line. This is standard too. But uh, it isn't as, as big a pecking order as where you have a big change in pigmentation. When they brought in the blacks in Hawaii, they had a major kind of crisis. And Hawaii, we thought, was a good place where everybody kind of gets on with the same close to pigmentation. But when the blacks came in, a new big scene, because the pigmentation jump was too big. And you find this, wherever you find a big pigmentation jump, like in, in America, we have a big pigmentation jump, and it's too much for people. They can't cope with it. A little pigmentation change is all right, but big pigmentation change is too much. It's out of somebody's range. And so we find people insulting one another rather badly. And other people trying to bridge the gap, and, and some people on an activist kick, having the uh, whites bed-banging with the blacks, and the, blacks bed banging with the whites and all that sort of stuff. You don't have bed banging in UCLA? Maybe that's a bad expression. By the way, I uh, should ask you, I don't, as a Quaker, I don't use any four-letter words in my presentations, uh, which seems to be the popular thing to do these days. Where was I the other day? Somebody opened a meeting, and it was a Catholic priest and he used the two most common four-letter words for the first hour and absolutely wiped out these people from all over the country <laughs> in a top, sort of a top-level management conference. And they just, he was supposed to come on to, he had actually supposed to be late in the program, but the fellow that was supposed to open the program, they thought they'd substitute the Catholic priest as a starter, and he just wiped them out with these four-letter words. But I don't use four-letter words, but I do occasionally use some expressions that are what I think fairly um, authentic, especially when we get into conversational exchanges, because we may be talking about conversational exchanges. And I would like to ask you before I go on whether I should use these expressions if I talk about conversational exchanges or whether I should uh, not use authentic language but use proper campus uh, language. I'd like to get a. The latter might be worse than the former. Could be. <laughs> now you people are all around uh, uh, life situations where people are fairly open when they have something controversial, or they're 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 on issues that they're uptight about, or they want to press a program. Don't you sort of get close to the nitty-gritty, or whatever they call it? So maybe I should uh, go ahead with, uh, with ordinary language exchanges, but I censor the four-letter words because they're out of my range. When I was a little boy, we weren't allowed to use any, any dirty words at all. We couldn't even, in fact, I had my mouth washed out for calling somebody a fool. <laughs> Because it says in the Bible, you don't call people a fool. I was told that anyway. I never read it. But we couldn't even say, gee or gosh. 
in my family because those are both, you know, gosh is a substitute for God and G is a substitute for slang for Jesus. So we couldn't say that. I couldn't use any profanity at all until I was a, about a senior in the university. And since then I've been associating with a Los Angeles man who hunts and fishes with me and he has a fairly uh, rich vocabulary <clears throat> so I've learned a little bit how to use profanity but it's whenever I use profanity of any sort it'll be you can recognize it as quoting somebody I only quote people <laughs> well I'm trying to get this a touch of it for you that this this value system that we designate and accept and it comes from our history it changes a little bit but we find when we study people they they're, they're very, very easily insulted depending upon the values that they have and this value range is almost unbelievable. And especially we find that the range of values in America, for instance, as we'll point up, is really quite unbelievable as well. We're a hodgepodge of all sorts of subcultures and one subculture really shocks us. I was with a chap yesterday, a day before yesterday, a young patient of mine that I thought because his father had split and his father is now on some religious kick with another woman and is a, lived as a hippie for a couple of years and the boy lived with him one year as a hippie with his new bed partner a religious uh, associate or whatever you want to call her. <laughs> and then he's kind of split between the traditional mother who's trying to give him an education through special private schools and the father who's on his kick. He works for one of the airlines, has, a, has some job, but the rest of the time he's in his pad. And he has this boy, he's 12 years old, come to the pad and the boy has really gotten so he, he uh, you know, kind of likes the pad, but also his father's a dropout in a sense. He, he likes his mother's traditionalism and he'd like to make it in school, but he's really split between the two. And now he lives in a fairly comfortable home, but he can't stand his mother who talks too much. So he goes to his own pad, which is a, a rotting boat in Sausalito. And I mean literally rotting. It's about half filled with water and uh, he sleeps there with his sleeping bag. And I went down to visit it the day before yesterday. And <clears throat> it's just pretty impossible for me. I don't see how he can, he can stay there. It's, and the whole uh, waterfront around there filled with hippies and sort of dropouts and dog do every place and debris, it's just kind of, uh, it, it, it really shocked me to see such a derelict area and derelict people because it's just out of my range. But he rather likes it. But as I say here again, for me, I got a little shook up just walking around that, that rotting area with the tide out and never saw such debris and the bottles and cans and garbage and they, they don't uh, do anything with it. The bottles, they of course just throw rocks at and, and bust them up, but uh, the rest of the debris is just cumulative. It was, a, it was kind of a shocker to me, and I was trying to be some kind of an influence. We have some new, new people, foreigners no doubt. Well, we have three black people. We really desegregated down here. And we got a fellow that's got kind of an oriental look about him too. Morning. <laughs> Are you people in range out there? Because there, there's room for a couple more seats up here. Are you all comfortable? What about you? You don't. You look like you're out of range. Are you all right? Let's take another characteristic. My beliefs. 
my assumptive system. I put that in the middle of the model because it's my belief system uh, is the core of my vulnerability. You see, I, I develop a belief system, an assumptive system, I like to call it, that orients me in the cosmos I live. You know, it, do I believe in God? Do I believe in free enterprise? Do I believe in competitive process? Do I believe in uh, sanitation? Do I believe in communication? Now, what do you believe in? You run your life by your beliefs. And since it's the sort of the basic stuff that says, I, I belong here, I relate here, it's pretty deep stuff, my assumptive system. And again, there's a very wide range of assumptions about the nature of ourselves and our cosmos. And if you have one assumptive system and somebody else has another assumptive system, how do you communicate? Suppose I'm an isolated man at stage one, religiously, because there were so many unknowns. You see, I, I don't know about all that stuff, and yet I know that there are a lot of influences coming in, impinging on me. And so to protect myself from these outside unknowns, I devise what we call a ritualistic system. We devise rituals as a class of life to ward off the bad stuff and pull in the good stuff. And if you've ever made a careful study of, of ritual systems, you'll find that there's an unbelievable range of things you do to ward off the bad, bring on the good. And I suppose you recognize that if I have devised a belief system and somebody else has another system, that unavoidably we're going to have insult. I was telling the class up at, up at Asilomar, you remember about this West Aryan culture where when somebody dies, they take a, a, a primitive axe, they bring a maiden forward, and then they, they just put the finger out of the maiden and go chomp and pop off one of the fingers and throw it in with the corpse. I wonder how many of you have, you know about that custom? You ever read about it? Anyway, they, these are some of the things people do. It's getting warmer in here. Is there a thermostat in the house? How's the, how's the weather for the rest of you? You all right so far? Anyway, let's imagine that, that somebody in the room has conked out and uh, I get this young lass to come up and put her hand out here and I take a Stone Age axe and I go boom and off pops the finger, kicks a little and we throw it in with a stiff. And, and I wonder if, if I turned to this lady and said, how'd you like that? <laughs> I wonder what you'd say or how you'd feel. You wouldn't what? Like it. You wouldn't like it. What would you say when Probably it just happened? Ouch! When it happened. Ouch! <laughs> now, if the study of this West Aryan culture is that there are no women that have more than five fingers, because a lot of people uh, going to the happy hunting ground or whatever they do. That's the way the women are there, and they don't seem to mind giving up their finger. What are you going to say? About the fingers? Yeah. It just happened. Boop! Hmm. Say that was an interesting... <laughs> <laughs> this man nods his head and says, that's an interesting culture. <laughs> what are you going to say? Well, you're shocked. Be shocked. You won't say anything? Possibly not. I would faint. You would faint. <laughs> What are you going to say? I'll be still. <laughs> <laughs> Got some jokesters here. What are you going to say? I wonder why. I wonder why. Well, I'd like to tell you, by the way, 
that there is a universal on the planet. I'm kind of, as an old philosophy major, I kind of look for universals. And one of the universals we find on the planet in the study of human beings, of neurosymbolic processes, is that what is sacred to one individual on this planet in terms of his rites and rituals and beliefs is disgusting and revolting to other people. And this is universal. That we have devised such a range of rites and rituals and beliefs that are sacred and there's not one on the planet that you can have that isn't disgusting and ridiculous to somebody else on the planet. I wonder if you know that's a universal. They don't come any other way. Now, if somebody's ritual is a little bit different from ours, just like the pigmentation is just a little bit different, well, that's not so bad. Okay. But if they're very different, oh, it's disgusting. Take me as a Quaker, you see. If I go to, especially if I watch a Catholic uh, ritual, you know, that, that really gets to me. I remember when I was in Spain a couple of years ago, I was, I was looking for some El Grecos, and I think we found one in a little church outside of Madrid. And as we were going through there and looking at this stuff, we came upon a case. And in the case was the jawbone of St. Bernardo. Now, I don't know how you people are about St. Bernardo jawbone, but as a Quaker, I can tell you, it didn't turn me on. <laughs> but the f thing was, and that didn't bother me, you know, if they want to keep a jawbone there, that's their business, that's all right with me, I felt like you, you know, you know it's kind of interesting. But on Corpus Christi Day, they'd drag this thing through the streets, and everybody, oh, oh, you know, <laughs> all that crazy stuff. And I thought, you're oh, goddamn primitives. <laughs> of course, I didn't say so. But that was my reaction to the fellas when they chopped off the finger. I thought, oh, boy, goddamn primitives. But I, you don't say that, you see. You're polite like this man. Interesting. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> eh? But you don't say anything. But your insides probably are really jumping to watch somebody chomp off a finger with a primitive axe or to watch somebody go through all that monkey business. Now, some people come to a Quaker meeting house, have same reaction. You know, we just sit there, eyes closed. And maybe you hear a stomach growl. Summertime, you might hear a fly buzzing. And that's it. <laughs> and some people come in there and they say, my God, this isn't religion. But it's that, it's that range of, of stuff we do that's our belief system. And if you have to do it, because, I mean, if you don't do it, you're not going to make it. It's like uh, we had a Spanish Catholic uh, daughter on the AFS program one year, and on Sundays I'd take her down to, the, to the, the local church, and then I'd come back and pick her up. And when I'd come pick her up, I'd say, well, how was the, how was the thing? She said it was very, very pleasant and so on and I said well while you were doing your thing in your in your institution I was cutting God's grass and I said it's just important for me to cut God's grass as probably for you to go do your thing with all that jumping around in there huh well she was pretty disgusted with me you know, because you got to do that stuff in your organization well, that's, that's important. In fact, she'd get pretty nervous if she didn't go every Sunday. She had a special dispensation, however, so she didn't have to eat meat. I mean, didn't have to eat fish on Friday. And that came about, for you people who didn't know, of course, you don't have to do that anymore. But at that time, the Spanish had a special thing because they had saved one of the popes in the old days, back about 600. And so they didn't, they didn't have to follow those church rules. <laughs> it's nice when you get special privilege, like I had last night. I had a 
very pleasant place to sleep. You ever, anybody slept in the guest house on the campus? Lovely place. Must be for President Nixon when he comes and visits. <laughs> Delightful to have special privilege once in a while. And for a finicky guy like me, it was just really beautiful. I'm sorry I didn't have a party. <laughs> it was equipped with a kitchen and glasses, no booze, but, and a barbecue place, everything. Anyway, uh, the point is that we're, we do have this range. And the other man's system, belief system. And if we look at it religiously, you see, let's look at religion here. At stage one, because of the unknowns, we had mostly a polytheistic universe. We had to do certain monkey business uh, to neutralize those bad things. When we got to stage two, we, we went from a polytheistic universe to a monistic theistic one. Most of you, I imagine, were raised with the monistic theistic system. Huh? Is there anybody who wasn't a monotheist? Weren't you all raised by the Big Daddy-O? And uh, there's a story I tell about Ebenezer. How many know Ebenezer? Yeah. You know? I don't remember what you have in mind. Well, just tell me, what was Ebenezer? Hmm. See, we have a biblical student. It's good to have. No, real, real, real biblical. I can't remember. Well, it's not a he, it's an it. An it? Ebenezer? It, you're thinking of Scrooge, maybe, but it's not an... It. Ebenezer is a rock that commemorates a confrontation between the Israelites and the Philistines, who incidentally are fighting today. I suppose you know the Jews and the Arabs are still at it. <laughs> but anyway, they've been fighting for thousands of years. And nobody knows how to solve that problem. Anyway, on this occasion, the Big daddy -o came down with his power and knocked out the bad guys. That's the story. And Ebenezer is the rock that commemorates that confrontation. And very serious theologians all over this planet are saying, and quite seriously, that God, the Big Daddy of God, is dead. And other equally serious theologians all over the planet are saying, that God is not dead. And a lot of them are trying to get you in on the dialogue. Huh? Is he dead or is he not dead? Now, how many in this room believe he's dead? Okay, so kind of a single. Look, he's got a beard too. Watch out for those people. <laughs> now, how many believe he's not dead? Let's see the hands. How many of you didn't vote? Where the hell are you on this thing? <laughs> Aren't you going to take signs? No. They're the, watch out for those kind. They're the worst. <laughs> These people that don't stand up and be counted. They're probably all subversives. <laughs> you got to believe like you got to believe. <clears throat> but you'll find that a lot of dialogues, confrontations, are trying to get people you know, like Billy Graham, you know how he comes on and does his thing. You believe? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I remember he used to do a thing I thought was very beautiful. He'd say, come up, come up, for Christ's sake, come up. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is that some people would come up. You know, that if you know anything about trance states, this is a trance state he's created because you'll notice his language the tone, his body gestures, and his assumptive system are all tied up together very beautifully. It's what we call a congruent message. And a lot of people go into a trance while he's doing that. And of course, they come up, and then they say, what am I doing here? <laughs> well, you know, here I am. Because they're in a kind of a trance, and then somebody takes them out of the trance later on and gets them involved financially, too. <laughs> but it's a nice way to relieve people of money is to get a little trance state going, because ministers and priests have been doing it for a long time. I suppose you notice that if you're doing a ritual, you're in a trance. You should know that, because that's 
And it's when you're in a trance state, in case you studied neurosymbolic processes like this, that the information comes through very, very directly when you're in a trance state. The, the words just seem to get right down inside the core of you. And this is why we create these trance states. This is how the whole process operates. When we're in our Quaker meeting house and we close our eyes, we're all in a, in a kind of a group trance. And if you've studied trance states, you recognize that almost all religious rituals all over the world are trance states. They're inductions. Anyway, it's this, it's this range. We said at stage one, we're a polytheistic. Here, we're a monistic theistic system. When we got to stage three, which we call the relating stage, which is the beginning of experimental science. In religion, we went from the monistic theistic system to the atheistic relativistic one, materialism. I think uh, Andy Water will talk about materialism. I don't know what he says about it. But this is the religious development went to atheism. Now, the monist doesn't understand the atheist. The atheist may understand the monist, may understand the polytheist. So the more sophisticated religious system understands the less sophisticated, but the less sophisticated generally doesn't understand the more sophisticated. But the big warfare, ideological warfare, is between what I call stage two and stage three, the monistic, theistic, and the atheistic, relativistic. If we want to put it on this scheme again, we've got from the isolated man, the primitive, to the pre-science orientation, to the early science orientation, to the modern science orientation, to the advancing science orientation. So we have that range. The person who is advancing science understands modern science and so on, but the person who is early science doesn't understand modern science. The pre-science culture doesn't understand the more sophisticated culture. And that's where it's at, as we say badly in grammar, uh, on the planet today. Because we literally have hundreds of millions of people on the planet at stage one, the isolated man, the brain's no different from ours. We have hundreds of millions of people at stage two, places like Korea and Vietnam and so on. We have hundreds of millions of people at stage three, Predominantly, the communist world is a stage three, early science, atheistic, relativistic culture. And we have modern science culture made up of a, a lot of the United States and some aspects of it advancing science. In technological sophistication, the communist world has it over us in some ways. But in terms of openness, free access to any kind of information in exchange, we're much more sophisticated than the Russians are. You'll find if you look at this in terms of open and closed, the most closed cultures run up this way and the more open cultures this way. Which means you allow free, free open society up this way and not down this way. Well, let's get, again, watch this assumptive thing and my beliefs. Some people, again, on their belief systems are very finicky. They have very closed religious systems. They say there's only one way to view the cosmos. And anything that comes on that's out of that range, they get an organismal insult. Some people have very broad range of beliefs. But it doesn't make a difference, as I say, if it's one or the other. If you're out of my range, we're going to have an insult. And usually when people are on the symbolic level are insulted, they break into symbolic behavior. They, they say something. How could she believe something like that? How could he wear a shirt like that, you see, or whatever it is? Or you're silent. But there's an impact in the organism. I'd like to give you one other universal. The human organism, they don't come any other way, overreacts. They don't come any other way. The human organism, as a bag of live tissue, overreacts 
all over the planet. Now when we overreact, some people have devised very, very effective ways of covering the whole, sh the whole shock. But there, the impact will be on the organism. Some people have learned how to look absolutely imperturbable, like some of you. you know, just look like you heard it all before, and what could be new, you know, sort of imperturbable. Couldn't shock you if I cut off my own finger to demonstrate it. <laughs> eh? You'd say that must have been a stage trick. <laughs> Anyway, this is universal, that we overreact. But then how we handle an overreaction is what we want to get into, especially the way we talk when we overreact. Then I have expectations, my whole anticipatory system. And again, that will have more to do with your insult, maybe, than, than what's going on. If I have big expectations when I sit down and, and listen to somebody, okay? maybe somebody says, you got to come hear this guy because it'll be the greatest thing that you ever heard. And somebody sits here and waits, uh, when's he going to begin? Okay? Because you had such big expectations that no matter what happens, you say, it's a bore. Or you might have, you might say, there's nobody in here that can tell me anything I don't already know. So you expect nothing, and by God, you get nothing. No, you didn't hear a thing. You had your set off the whole time. But how, your approach and your expectations, you see, your whole motivational system's involved in here. Your little, your future, your time binding, you're beginning to predict and all sorts of stuff is fit in here. But as far as your insult and balance, and that's what we call it, dynamic homeostasis. See, we have to maintain some balance in that organism as we breathe in and out from the time we're conceived until we coagulate. Homeostasis, huh? On the trip you take through life, you've got to have some balance. And anything that throws you out of balance, we call insult. And I like that general term because I can be insulted on the chemical level, on the physiological level, on the affective level, and on the symbolic level. But it doesn't make a lot of difference whether you're insulted on the chemical level or the physiological level or the symbolic level. The organism goes through the same kind of reactions as if there is a physical insult. And most human insult comes from here. Most human insult is symbolic insult. You listen to somebody talking back and forth. Most of our exchanges are on the verbal level. Somebody says something, somebody says something back, and right away, we got a great big thing going. I'm telling it like it is. You're a racist. How many of you get racist thrown at you? How many of you had racist, the word racist thrown at you by somebody? Well, what do you say? Let's take a little talk chain. This is a talk chain. Somebody says, I'm for law and order. And the other person says, you're a racist. Well, what do you say next? You're a racist, and I'm looking at you. I'll go. What the hell's that grunt? <laughs> what, you come out with Chinese or something? <laughs> you're a racist. He's the worst kind. He's one of the quiet, sneaky ones. <laughs> and he looks so affable. You're a racist. You're right. What a gooey answer. Did you hear him? <laughs> You're right. He's very consistent, this guy. He's a cop-out. He's a sneaky cop-out, too. He doesn't come out and tell it like it is. He kind of agrees with you with his milk toast. And it's not even warm milk toast. Well, we'll get into this when we get into the dialogue exchange. But th this is what we do when we have an insult. We talk, but nobody seems to know how to talk. 
when we get into insult patterns. I want to talk about homeostasis briefly, which I mentioned, and hyperexis, just as a couple of principles. As I said, the universal is that the human organism overreacts. It's a very sensitive bag of tissue and has a quite vulnerable nervous system. And it has its automatics to restore balance. If I get a chemical invasion, like virus and bacteria, I automatically produce antibodies to neutralize the foreign bodies. Huh? If I get a blow to the tissues, I have automatic procedures for sending the right kinds of building materials to repair the damage. If somebody upsets my feeling, my automation goes to work to restore balance. We call it the homeostatic mechanism. It's in all living <coughs> tissue. The hyperexic mechanism is another one that has to do with generally what causes more trouble. In hyperexis, what my body does to restore balance makes it worse. In an allergy, for instance, if I get some foreign body invasion, I produce fluids to wash it out. In an allergy, you produce too many fluids, and you've got edema. You've got swelling, so it doesn't really solve the problem. In an asthmatic attack, what do you do when you have an asthmatic attack? You cough to relieve the congestion. And if you don't stop coughing, you may die from an asthmatic attack, and yet the body's doing what comes natural to relieve the congestion. There are many diseases, heart diseases, cancer we're thinking of now as a hyperexic disease because we can tell fast-growing cancers from slow-growing cancer people on the basis of psychological tests. There are some people that are just good candidates for hyperexic cancer. And heart disease, same thing. The, the, the so-called athlete's heart is what? Your heart is working overtime in a crisis, and then there's no crisis, and it's still working overtime. It's doing something, like, hey, you, quiet down, quiet down, you know? But it doesn't quiet down. Or if you want a good example of hyperexis, you can study Bleiberg's case. You man, remember the man with the alien heart? Now, when you get an alien heart in your body, your body tries to destroy the alien heart. You produce the fluids to kill the heart because it's an alien heart. That's the way your body works. Now what they did with Bleiberg, they were able to neutralize the killers of his heart for about 18 months. And pretty soon they couldn't put any more neutralizers in and he killed his alien heart. Now if you see you could talk to the tissue, you'd say, hey look, you damn fool, take it easy, don't knock out that heart, that's keeping you going. But you see, it doesn't work that way because the tissues say, I know, I know a bad object when I see one. And they have done a recent study now, I think here it was UCLA, wasn't it, where they're finding that some people tend to be more hyperexic than others. And so we can tell who will be a pretty good candidate for a transplant and who won't. Because some people just aren't very good transplant candidates because they're going to knock it out with their hyperexic mechanisms. Now, the same sort of thing as that goes on in, in our talking to one another and our thinking. Because we have a crisis in the organism. There's an insult to the organism. And I start to think. I start to talk. And my thinking and talking, which is supposed to restore balance, makes things get worse. And after we've had this preliminary sort of stuff, I'm going to talk about the way we talk, because that's where we're down to the kind of thing you people are involved in. Talking to people in crisis. You've got to influence somebody. Everybody in the room is in the business of influencing somebody. You seem to be... Step on some gum or... Me. Okay. 
Well, a hyperexic minute, just want you to keep it in mind because we're going to talk about our talk and I'll show you what kinds of talk are not going to make this thing function better but going to make it function less well. Might mention some what I call the three R's of human nature touch on as we go by and then we'll finish this scale. When we have when we have an insult to the organism, we find it has some automatics built in it. One is retribution. Revenge. Almost any living tissue has some kind of a retribution mechanism. Even fish. I find fish, at a low level of fish, if you're at the right time of the year, you can throw a piece of metal at a fish if it's spawning time. He attacks the metal, not to eat it, but to get even with it for insulting him. Most California fishing is retribution fishing because they don't like natural bait too much in California. They have a hard time. Maybe some people are fly fishermen, but most people I find take a lot of hardware along and throw those things out and scare the fish, and the fish get even with them. I had a friend one day telling me about fishing in a little pond up near our place and he was fishing for trout and he was looking over here in the rush and here was a big bass sitting in there. So he thought he'd try a little smart aleck stuff and he threw a little triple hook over there and he tried to snag it. And he apparently got it on the side as it came up but you know it chip and he missed it. But he must have ripped it a little bit but anyway. the f this. This bass just took off and he thought, well, that takes care of that. And then he went on back trout fishing. And a few minutes later, he looked and there's that bass right back in the same spot. So this time he thought he'd do it again. Put on his little triple hook and as he threw the triple hook out there, the bass, Aff! you know, I'm going to, that's the thing that snagged me. By God, I'm going to get even with that, you know. And of course, he caught him. Well, it's retribution at a very low level. If I say something or do something that insults your bag of protoplasm, you're going to get even. It's, just, it's as natural as breathing. It's universal. I mean, human beings, if you're insulted, you're going to get even. How many of you have tried to pick up a dog that somebody ran over? Anybody done that? And what happens when you try to pick up a dog that's been run over? He bit me. He bites you! And you say, by God, I didn't run over you. <laughs> and he bites you. Well, that's just retribution. A big insult, and so he snaps out. There are an awful lot of people in our culture that are insulted, especially the blacks. They're insulted practically every day. And they just, they're like a dog that bites at people. <laughs> you say, what the hell, I didn't do anything. Well, your grandfather did, or something, you know. And they snap right like a, like a dog that's been run over snap any way they go. And it doesn't have to be a black man that can have that happen. It can be anybody. As we all get insulted quite a bit, a lot of ways to get insulted in living in a complex culture. Another one we call re oh, restitution, or redemption, all these things that have to do with <coughs> repression. What we do in this one is that there's an insult, but I censor it. And we find a lot of people have censorship automatically. We, you may be living around somebody that you really can't stand their guts. You know, they really annoy you. You may not be aware that they're annoying you. You have censored it because you don't, you're not aware. But you may find you have, uh, uh, you're constipated or something every time you're around this person. <laughs> And you say, I wonder why it is. This person makes me get all tied up. Huh? You use that expression. And that may be... <laughs> nice legs. <laughs> uh, I think that's going to sound funny on the... <laughs> anyway, these big negatives these big negatives accumulate. 
the organism accumulates these big negatives. And the tragedy is if you've accumulated a lot of anger and guilt, you see, you accumulate a lot of this stuff, then you have the tragedy of, of miscoding incoming information. The extreme example will be a man in a state hospital. They, they miscode almost any kind of a message. Anybody who's been insulted a lot, we say they're paranoid. You know how we say they're paranoid? Which, and what the hell does that mean? Huh? That means I've had so many experiences of insult that something happens and I, I read insult into it when it wasn't there. And that's characteristic of anybody who's been insulted a lot. And I don't know anybody, there's nobody in this room who hasn't been insulted enough but what you get a little paranoid over somebody that sort of uh, holds you accountable for an error or something. And you say, God damn it, it wasn't my fault. Huh? And you keep picking on me. Well, maybe, I imagine you all have had that happen. We got another one we call reciprocation. That's the big positive, which we'll get into when we deal with therapeutic dialogue. Because the second part of my presentation will be discussing therapeutic dialogue. I've been a psychotherapist for 30 years. And there's something we do in a therapeutic dialogue that people begin to function better. You know, a, as we say, it's a pretty simple thing. I talk to you, and you listen sometimes, and you watch me talk, and then you talk to me, and I listen, and I watch you talk, and pretty soon you feel better, and you function better. And we say, what, what takes place in a therapeutic dialogue that makes people function? You'll find every one of you have devised some way of talking to people at times they seem to be just coming along great and you're really moving and you're getting something accomplished and other times you talk to people and you find you get no place and I want to sort of isolate out those two extremes and some examples of how we talk to one another in a therapeutic dialogue so you get cooperative behavior and growth promoting behavior for both of you that's what we call therapeutic dialogue. And that involves the law of reciprocation. In reciprocity, you see, just like in these, if somebody comes on that causes me to react up here, you see, this is as normal as breathing, I'm going to react either, I'm going to be an anger outer, an anger inner. But if somebody down here does something, see, this is somebody shutting me down up here. And if somebody shuts me down, there's an insult to the organism, and these things take place. Down here, somebody does something beneficial to the organism. And if I do something beneficial to you, you're in debt to do something beneficial for me. And that's where the law of reciprocity works. If I understand you, you're in debt to understand me in a conversational exchange. And we'll get into that when we talk about the way we talk. I went to hear, is, is uh, Miss Davis still teaching on the campus here? Angela? I went to hear her the other day. By the way, how many here in the room feel that she should be allowed to teach and get credit for her course? How many believe you shouldn't she get, she shouldn't be teaching on the campus or getting credit? How many people didn't vote? How many people didn't vote and didn't even say they didn't vote? <laughs> well, I'm just kind of interested in, in the nose count. How many were for seating Hainsworth on the Supreme Bench? Let's see the hands of those who wanted to seat him on the Supreme Bench. How many were against seating him on the Supreme Bench? Oh, he's got two hands up. How many didn't vote on that issue? Well, I kind of get a group. I find that there's some places I go and bring up Angela Davis and almost everybody, and maybe there'll be one person that says she should be teaching. 
So you kind of get a picture of somebody's philosophical biases by asking these questions. But I went to hear her. And uh, have you all heard her? How many haven't heard her? Oh. Anyway, I went to hear her. And she was at the Glide Memorial Church up in San Francisco. And one of my students at the Unitarian series that I gave asked, asked me if I'd sit in. So I listened to her. And I was really shockingly disappointed in her. Because I, at least my decoding, I was hoping she'd be a kind of creative. The only creative thing she said was that she was against the three R's, Reagan and, and uh, Rafferty and the Regents. But outside of that, she didn't have much very creative to offer. I was disappointed because I thought she would come out with something more creative. And what she came out with was that straight old communist line that I've heard for 40 years. I was really shocking that she came out with that same old fight in the streets now. My own theory is that the blacks don't make very good communists. Because if you're a communist, if you don't know anything about communists, communists have to have long range, very subtle plans. And they may take a generation or two to gain power. But they play undercover games all the time. And I don't know any Negroes that can play those undercover games. They're too honest. They're too open and honest to play those long range undercover communist games. And they'll tell you just like it is, while they feel like she did. And you, of course, you're already there with a the machine gun. You wiped her out before she got to stand up. And I think that's what's going to happen to the blacks. They, they can't. They're too open and honest. They're going to, they're going to signal where they're going to be, <laughs> and how many guns they're going to have. That's what I'm afraid. They won't make it as communists. But I was really disappointed in, in Angela. I was hoping she'd say something creative. It was just to me, it was a, that same old naked communist line I'd heard for 40 years. It really was a shocker to me. Well, we'll get into that after a bit. Let's see, we got another thing up here, stage four. We call it the postulating stage of man's development. That's modern science. And what we're discovering with a with the postulating position is that reality, that is the way I think, feel, and behave, is partly determined by my postulational system. It's my basic assumptions about life. I'm a victim of my own postulating system. And when we deal with religion, for instance, I find it's study of neurosymbolic processes when we get to religious study, everybody is a victim of his early pickups. I'm a birthright Quaker, and I think it's the best way to be. And I'm tolerant of some of you people. But uh, eventually, you'll get the message. Uh, you know what the Quaker message is, by the way, you people? It's a fairly simple one. We're simply trying to say, and have been for several hundred years, you do not solve major human problems by piling up corpses. The war game has been obsolete almost from the beginning and gets more obsolete the more sophisticated our technology becomes. But uh, eventually you'll get the message. I would like to convert you all uh, to the Quaker viewpoint. But uh, I don't suppose I'm going to get that far today. <laughs> anyway, what we're trying to say at stage four is if you are a birthright Catholic or a birthright whatever you are, you're pretty much going to hang on to that formulation because it's part of your secondary nature. And you can't distinguish your primary from secondary nature once it's inside there. And so you're going to continue to be a Catholic or uh, are you a Buddhist? You're not a Buddhist? Are you a native? No. Native American? No, naturally. From where? Formosa, yeah. one of those new kind, huh? New kind of Chinese? Formosa Chinese. Are you a Formosan or are you a... a Northern part of China. You came from China. 
Anyway, there are quite a few Buddhists among the Formosans, aren't there? Yep. Are you a Christian? I guess so. You guess? <laughs> are you? I think so. Kind of weak people, aren't they? They don't really stand up. <laughs> Well, anyway, let's get on. There's a stage five up here we call a unifying stage. And that's just to kind of complete the chart, the unifying stage. If you've had, I call stage five a transitory experience. But if you've ever had a stage five experience, and you can have one, by the way, on LSD, I'm told. If you've ever had a stage five experience, how many have tried marijuana, by the way? And, uh, well, you can have a stage five experience with marijuana if you get the right kind of stuff. Uh, and if you've ever had a stage five experience, it's kind of a mind-expanding experience, a cosmic experience, we used to say, a religious experience, we sometimes call it. But if you've ever had one, you suddenly say, hey, I'm in tune with the process. I feel I kind of dig what it's all about. And the first commandment of the Bible uh, thou shalt uh, have an affirmative feel for thy cosmos. <clears throat> That's the way I translate it. Somehow that makes sense. Because you do get this big affirmative feel for your cosmos. And you have tapped that great big pocket of affection and concern. And you find there's not a stranger on the planet suddenly. People are people. The fact that they have different hang-ups or different secondary natures is, becomes very superficial. If you've ever had a stage five experience, of course, you'll know it. And you'll notice that your loyalties and concerns really broaden out. But it's very difficult to talk about a stage five experience. It's, a, it's like a, a Taoist, I guess. You, I mean, you can't, you can't speak about it. If you try to translate it, you'll probably translate it through your early stage two religion. If you're a Christian, you probably uh, think of a prayer or a hymn. If you're a, if you're a Muslim, you'll probably chant or something. <laughs> anyway, it, I hope somebody, all of you, have a stage five experience before you go to the happy hunting ground. Because it, uh, it really gets you in tune with, with the, whole, the, whole, the whole scene. Sometimes, by the way, you'll have one of those when somebody close to you dies. It may grow right out of the biggest tragedy in your life. Funny kind of uh, integrating experience of the organism, but you really touch the cosmos. Well, there are three stances here, philosophically, that I might talk about. And I might demonstrate, I suppose, some. How many of you know phenylthiocarbamide? Just a few chaps that were up. You know phenylthiocarbamide too. I wonder if we could do a little demonstration. If you know about phenylthiocarbamide, why, you can shut up. But for you people who don't know, I'll, I'll distribute these phenylthiocarbamide papers. That ought to get around. Uh, somebody have a piece of paper we can would you put them on a piece of paper I'm trying to keep our grammy hands make them as sterile as possible I'll see how far those go there may be some left over here uh, help yourself to one have one Let's see if I got any more this is a piece of typing paper there's some extras up here It's a piece of typing paper. How many didn't get one yet? How many do not have a piece yet? Well, this is a piece of typing paper been dipped in phenylthiocarbamide solution, dried and cut up. It's a harmless chemical. You won't go on a trip. 
But what I want you to do in the name of science is this little experiment. I'm putting it on your tongue and push around. Get acquainted with it. How many haven't tried it yet? How many haven't put it in your mouth? What's your trouble? I don't exactly know. I just didn't put it in there. Just didn't want to experiment. You mean you're not quite at the stage three of experimentation. You're back at stage two, maybe, huh? Huh? If that's what it is, I didn't put it in. But really want What's your trouble? Well, wouldn't you like to participate in the research? Yeah. This is a research project. Come on, I want you to participate. Have your hand up. Yes, I do. Well, I didn't see it. That's all I could say. I didn't see your hand up. Okay, I want to find out what you're thinking when I tell you that. That tasted better. You don't hear too well. There is no taste in this paper. <laughs> And I'm telling it like it is, friend. You mean the taste is in my mouth? There, there's no taste, period. I don't follow you. What do you think of my true statement? <laughs> huh? Negative. Negative. It has to be qualified. What do you mean, qualified? Well, the taste is in the paper, it's in the chemicals you put on it. But there's no taste in phenyl thiocarbamide. That's what I'm telling you. What do you think of my true statement? It's a fact that there's no taste in phenyl thiocarbamide. It's relative. Oh, one of those relativists, huh? <laughs> some do, some don't. Who's getting excited, huh? What are you thinking? <laughs> There's no taste. I'm telling it like it is. That's right. That's right. What are you thinking of my true statement that it does not taste? We've got confirmation here. How you doing? I thought it was bitter. Well, now I'm telling it like it is. There's no taste in phenothiocarbamide. What are you thinking of that statement, which is true? I think you're entitled to your opinion, but I don't agree with that. Uh -huh. I'm entitled to my opinion. <laughs> doesn't it? It really doesn't taste. <laughs> Didn't you see all those hands? I saw some hands, yeah. How many said it doesn't taste? Let me see your hands. Now look at all those. May we ask another pertinent question? How many didn't have it? Well, A.W.'s never told me a lie, but there could be a first time. <laughs> <laughs> now, you see, I gather he's suggesting that you're a liar. <laughs> he's, he's a very gentle man, so he doesn't really call you a goddamn liar, but he says uh, it's possible that you're lying to <laughs> me. He's so gentle about his conversational exchanges. How many think that I'm lying when I say there's no taste in phenyl thiocarbamide? What are the rest of you thinking outside of I'm a liar? Maybe you have different taste buds than the rest of us. You saying I got faulty taste buds? That's a problem for us. How do you like that? Apparently a lot of us got faulty taste buds. <laughs> got faulty taste buds, I'm a liar. Anything else you're thinking? Why didn't you put it on all? Are you suggesting that some had it and some didn't? Well, that's a polite way of calling me a liar, too. They're, it all was cut from the same sheet, so everybody gets the same amount. You don't believe that? He's skeptical, too. Well, let's look at the assumptions. If I'm at what we call stage two, which I call the pre-science model, qualities are in things. The bitterness is in the chemical. The yellow brown is in the or gold is in the tie. Hmm? Qualities are in things. Meanings are in words. Values are in objects. And pigs is pigs. If I'm at what these are the absolutists. If I'm at stage two Stage three, I'm a relativist, I'm an early science. I say qualities are determined by my own perceptual apparatus. 
and some people have one kind of apparatus and others have another kind. If I'm in optics, early science optics, we say, hey, that gold color is determined by my cones. And some people we find have different cones, different structure cones, so they don't see the same color. So it's a relative matter. Who are the relativists in here? You and somebody else. Are you the relativist? If you're at stage four, modern science, we talk about this process, only we use the term transactionism. There's a transaction going on between that stuff and what's in here. And we have a transaction reaction. Let's take a pair of nervous systems. We take a man and a woman, and we, we have them get together. And there's maybe some overlap, and maybe there's some differences. But something happens, like they have a taste on the phenylthiocarbamide papers, and they react. They may react in terms of the overlap, the similarities, or they may react in terms of the differences, x and y. If we react in terms of the similarities, we don't have much of a problem, you see. Suppose something happens and we're both upset. Oh, oh by gosh, that shook the hell out of me. And you say, by God, it shook me too. <laughs> or something happens, you see, that's very pleasant. Oh, by gosh, wasn't that great? And you say, yeah, sure was great. But suppose we don't hit the overlap. We hit the X and Y. Then, of course, we start to talk. That's where we get into trouble. <laughs> because, you see, if I've reacted differently, oh, by God, shook the hell out of me. And I look at you, and you haven't moved at all. And I say, what the hell? Are you dead or something? Are you a zombie? And you'll probably say, God damn it, shut up. I'm all right. You're just getting excited. Now relax. And I'll say, look, who's uptight? You're the one that's uptight. And we're going to have a big kind of a thing because we didn't hit the overlap. Now, if you're a stage two man or woman, once you've reacted and said, that's the way it is, you see, if anybody says anything else, you've got a big confrontation going. If you're a stage three man, at least you can say, well, some, some do and some don't. And you don't get so uptight. If you're stage four, you see, you say, my gosh, that's interesting. We're involved in the same event and one of us got pretty uptight, and the other one didn't seem to be bothered at all. How do you like that? Now, isn't that interesting? And then we'll go back, and we may even talk about our secondary nature, and begin to understand one another. But the whole approach is different, but what I'm trying to get to here is that if you're at stage two, the most you can do is call somebody a liar, or faulty taste buds, or different paper, no, that's about it. If you're at stage three, you can say, oh, well, you have your bag and I'll have mine. But at stage four, we can understand this process. The transactionist viewpoint, viewpoint makes it possible for us to recognize that we have different realities. And we exchange information about our realities. And our realities are partly determined by our secondary nature. We seem to be having invasions. Is it about coffee time? Is that what? Is that the message I'm getting? Is that correct? So these are the three positions that I want to talk about. And right after the coffee break, we'll get into talking about that next model that talks about the distribution of these people, how many we can expect to see and rec recognize and understand, and then we'll go into how we talk about these confrontations where, where there are differences, how we can make things begin to, to roll again if you get a little more sophisticated. But the main presentation here about this one is if you're a more sophisticated guy, you can understand less sophisticated people, but less sophisticated people have a difficult time, if at all, understanding more sophisticated people. I could take a simple analogy. If I'm at 
stage two as a child and I've learned a mathematical system that's involving in one, two, threes, we can learn to do some computations this way and solve some problems. And then at stage three math, we find we've introduced letters. Now the man at stage two who sees the letters in math says, what's this stuff? And the man here says, well, give me a complex problem at this level, and at this level I can solve it like that. This man can't understand this man's mathematics, but this man can understand this man's mathematics. And when we get to modern math down here, this gets quite complicated. And advancing math, gee, I can't even begin to decode it myself. I'm completely lost. I'm lost in modern math. But the modern math man can solve very complicated problems. I've got a formula in my notebook here that's a very sophisticated advanced science formula. And I, I, I can put it on the blackboard for you, but it means nothing to me. But you know what the formula is? It is a formula for putting a missile in space and maintaining it in space. And I can tell you the guy that knows how to utilize that kind of stuff has probably got the drop on us. <laughs> and I don't know very many black people who know that formula yet. They haven't got the formula that's going to make them sophisticated enough to get the drop on us. Well, there it is. It says VE, well, let me put it up here so you can see it. I don't know what that is. I don't know if that's a U or a V. R O square root of 2 G R O T H. How do you like that? Now, you know, for me, I say, yeah, any messages there? My God, that's over my head. I don't know what the hell they're talking about. But you see, if you're a very sophisticated advanced science mathematician, huh, you mean you don't know that? Well, you don't belong to the fraternity or something, you see. But that's where we are. The transactionists can understand less sophisticated, less sophisticated can understand more sophisticated. And the same thing goes with talk. We're going to talk about the way you talk. And there's a difference in talking about talk than just talking. Most people are just talking. And when we get down here, we're talking about our talk to see if our talk is leading to crisis, perpetuating crisis, or diminishing crisis. I wrote the vice president the other day, and I said, you're a nice guy, and I agree with most of the things you say, but you're polarizing the public every time you open your mouth. So I sent him one of my papers and said, if you come out our way, I'll give you a half day free. Because <laughs> you ought to learn how to stop polarizing people. There are ways of putting your message across that are effective and don't polarize people. As I say, if your value system agrees with him, then of course, great. If your value disagrees, you just call him a nut. But it polarizes people. And there are ways of talking down here that do not polarize people. Anyway, I got a, a polite letter from him, from his secretary, yesterday, and said, the vice president asked me to write you and thank you for this, his, your recommendation. And he wants me to tell you that he appreciates it. Eh? Form letter number X134. <laughs> <laughs> but it was nice to get an acknowledgement. What about a cup of coffee or something. Are you going to explain, is there a difference between... Phenylthiocarbamide? Yeah, somebody's waiting for phenylthiocarbamide. We did some research on phenylthiocarbamide, and we found out that 7 out of 10 people tasted as bitter. There was a rather unusual distribution here. How many are tasters? Let me see the hands. You tasted something. Well, uh, how many didn't taste it? Well, that's about 7 out of 10. Now, whether you taste it or not is determined by your inherited genes, like the color of your skin or the kind of hair, or the color of your eye. This is a gene. It doesn't mean a damn thing. But notice when we got into a confrontation over it, the confrontation is because of your level of sophistication or naivety. And notice that some of you insulted me, calling me a liar and so on, because I came out in what I call a stage two statement. Did you notice how I came out and said, there's no taste? Well, that's a straight stage two absolutistic statement, 
and immediately I got a lot of insults. I authored my own insults, but I knew what I was doing, of course, and of course, uh, Agnew doesn't. <laughs> At least I don't think so. That may be a bad interpretation. Maybe he likes to insult people. Anyway, it's 10 o'clock, and I guess some of you'd like some liquids one way or another. On page, uh, on page one, there's some, some things that look like this. It's just a matter of playing some sort of tit-tat-toe games, like we can take people and put them in this four square and talk about IQs, for instance, and RQs. They go from high to low. If you're, anybody know, everybody knows an IQ? You know what an RQ is? That's a reliability quotient. Has to do with saying you'll do something and doing it. A few years ago, I was talking with a woman who's the head of a, a department in the state government. And she said, uh, we never, hire anybody unless they have a college degree. And I said, well, is that uh, because people who go to college have more information than people who don't go to college? He said, no, it had anything to do with information. I said, well, is it uh, because people who go to college are brighter than people who don't go to college? No, it had anything to do with intelligence. And I said, well, they're not brighter, they're not more informed. What? What's the, what's the thing? She says, well, anybody who's gone through four years of college has a fairly high RQ. That means we can count on them. They're reliable. We can give them a job and they'll do it. If the relationship between what I say and do and what I do is, is a good relationship, consistent, I develop for myself confidence. See, I say I'll do something and I do it. If you say you'll do something and you consistently do it, I develop confidence in you. The word is trust. Now these are the probably the most fundamental building blocks we have to make human beings relate meaningfully to other human beings. I've got to trust you. And I've got to have a confidence in me. Suppose, on the other hand, you say you'll do something and you don't do it. I lose my trust in you. I say I'll do something and I consistently don't do it. I lose my confidence. So the person with a low RQ is a, is a difficult person to have around. We want somebody who's fairly reliable, has a fairly high RQ. Now, if, I have, if I'm bright and reliable, I really got the world on a string. We have one problem only with these people, and that is they can't stand people who aren't bright and reliable. Because <laughs> if you're bright and reliable, boy, do people annoy you who aren't bright and reliable. Then we have people who aren't very bright, but they're still reliable, and they've got it made. Most companies will tell you, I don't care if he's not so bright, as long as we can count on him. Having a quick game of basketball? <laughs> Some people, you know, just aren't very prompt. They're RQs. We've got a little deficiency here. We're just talking about reliability. When you set up a program, well, you're supposed to hang around. God damn it. Quoting somebody. <laughs> By the way, did you think about dirty words? If you're a stage two man, you know, mother gives you that message, dirty words are dirty. The dirt is in the word. 
if you're a stage three man, you go away to the university, like the University of California, Berkeley at least, you find out, by God, dirty words aren't dirty. Just dirty people up there. <laughs> <laughs> and what is dirty for one isn't dirty to the other. Huh? And of course, when you go home during the holidays and tell mother, and you go back and say, mother, I just found out dirty words are dirty. Mother says, communist influence. <laughs> and mother knows because she's stage two. <laughs> if you get to stage four, the whole bag changes because you say, hey, I recognize that if you live in a culture, there are taboos. There's not a culture on the planet that doesn't develop taboos. And there are words that relate to taboo behavior. They're taboo words, as there's taboo behavior. And so if I am an adult, I have to find out what, what words you're sensitive to. And if I find you're sensitive to some words, I won't use those words. And you, in turn, in a reciprocal way, will find out what words I'm allergic to. This is how we operate. If I find when I first used a, some expression a while ago, and I noticed you looked a little shocked, so I thought maybe I better ask about whether I can use dirty words, <laughs> because you looked offended. And if I find out there's some words you don't want me to use, then I won't use those words. I've gone beyond tolerance. Tolerance is at this stage. Tolerance, our old definition of tolerance is putting up with a bastard until he sees the light. <laughs> Are you tolerant? <laughs> okay. Anyway, let's get down to this one now. Here I am, very bright, but not reliable. And those are the, the kooks. They're the alcoholics. The alcoholic is notoriously unreliable. And he has said 10,000 times, eh, I'll never drink again. Where's the bottle? <laughs> and he has no confidence, no trust. But he's very bright and plays the blame game endlessly. <laughs> now, if it hadn't been for that, I'd have made it. So it's not my fault. And he maybe spend a lifetime playing the blame game with that good automation. But he's a cop out. Then we have people over here who are neither bright nor reliable. And they're the dropouts. And a lot of those people were giving a second chance. And a lot of them are in your halls, I presume, huh? Some of them? Do you have any of those second chance people? People out of the ghettos are giving another shot at see if they can make it. And I tell you, some of these dropout people are very tough to come on with because they've been busted so many times. The trust has been broken so many times that they read it in everything. You can come on authentically with them, shake your, put out your hand, give them a real heart to heart, and they spit on you. I expect some of you people have been spit on, maybe. Maybe you haven't gone that far. But these dropout people are what we're trying to rescue because we'd like them to make it because of themselves and because it makes the culture function. Well, this is just a way of playing tit-tat-toe. We can play another one here. Like, uh, we can be open and not open. Or we'll put, we can be honest, not honest, and we can be open and not open. And we find some people are open and honest. And if you've got open people who are also honest people, it's a delight to be around them. And then you have people who are not honest, but open. And you got trouble. Well, they can tell you, well, that's the way it was. I can tell you. And it's a bunch of phony. And some people can be very honest, but they don't say a thing. No? I would imagine most of the people in this room are honest people, but a lot of you are pretty shut down. Pretty quiet. 
lot of things going on in the alimentary canal, but pretty quiet about it. And then, of course, there are these baddies over here that are they're not open, not honest. And they're probably pretty hung up people. And they're tough to talk to, as I say. Well, that's just a kind of a game thing. You can make anything you want out of it. The fellow that devised that, that I know that did some interesting things, did it with a quartet of things of known to me, known to you, not known to me, not known to you in a quartet. This is Joseph Luft. He called his thing one of these creative things you do for a master's degree, I guess. It was called Johari's Window. And uh, his name was Joseph something, Joseph Luft, and his partner's name was Harrison something. So they came up with this beautiful thing called Johari's Window. That's uh, relevant research at the university level. <laughs> nice guy, Joseph Luft. Uh, by the way, we were talking about beliefs, and I'd like to put a little reminder of how important believing is. See, we have a kind of a paradox in believing. You can't, you can't really have your organism function unless you believe rather intensely on things. This is the paradox, you see. I can't be a part-time Christian scientist. I can't be a part-time Catholic I, or a Mormon or whatever it is. You've got to kind of go all the way with it because if you don't really believe it, your tissues won't get the message. And yet this is the paradox. If I have to, to, to make my system function, I've got to believe deeply. And yet if you and I run into each other and we've got opposing very deep beliefs, we can't communicate. If I'm a Jew and you're an Arab, or vice versa, and we believe in our own system, have you had a conference? Have you talked to Jews and Arabs about the problem? You talk to an Arab and he says, you know, we didn't invite those guys here. They are a cancer growing in the side of our body. Mad proliferation, and we don't hate them, we're just going to exterminate them, <laughs> going to push them out in the sea because we have to do radical surgery. And I can say, I, 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 when I talk to an Arab, I can say, I can see how you feel that way. It wasn't your decision making. It was made during, after the war and so on. So that's the way it was. And if I talk to a Jew, I say, well, I get your, I get your message. You, you, you're entitled to breathe in and out. And really, you're just taking a desert and making a garden out of it. And the whole way of life is beautiful, as far as I can see. And I can understand how you feel about the Arab. And I'm this way when I have a couple come in. I can have a couple come in, and I talk to the woman, and she gives me her tale of woe, and I say, oh, boy. I can see how impossible it is to live with that bastard. Huh? And then. I talk to the man and I say, my God, now I can see how come it is difficult to live with that bitch. Hmm? You know, and I, I, can, I can really sense the position they're in. But the question is, where do we go beyond just understanding somebody? We gotta, is it possible to make this program work? Who around on the planet can get the Jew and the Arab to talk together? You know, who, who wants to talk? We don't want to talk. We don't want to pretend. We want to pretend they don't exist. Red China doesn't exist. No. We do that all the time. Uh, Eastern Germany doesn't exist. And in the Polish and other places, they say, Western Germany doesn't exist. We don't recognize them. We pretend they're not there. It's a great game of diplomacy. We all have pretenders on. We're punishing them. We're punishing with ignoring them. Well, it's a, it's a strategy. Let's get on with our bit. What I sometimes talk about are the, the, the major problems I see it on the planet is, is the gaps. Are the gaps, what's the proper grammar? The gaps between the haves and the have-nots, and this is the major problem in the United States. 
It's the haves and the have-nots in almost every realm. Whether you have beauty or talent, skill, power, prestige, money, it doesn't mean what it is. Education, information. The man who doesn't have it is insulted. His existence is an insult. That is, he's feeling insulted. Because I can't help but translate, if I'm a have-not, that I must be inferior. And I don't accept that basic idea. And this is the big problem. In America, it seems to be getting the gaps are getting bigger. There's been a gap between our technological sophistication and philosophical obsolescence, and that's what I'm here for, to try to close the gap between the technological sophistication we have. We're all pretty sophisticated, technology. But philosophically, look what we can do. We, we go up and horse around on the moon up there, but we can't even live together. And that's because of our non-awareness of the neurosymbolic formulation that we're a symbolic class of life that's highly insultable and we haven't learned how to handle the insults, except to do the same things that our primitive forebears did, knock off the other guy. I was listening to an 18-year-old watching a television set the other day. And just a football game, Dallas was playing somebody, and he's a Dallas fan. I think it was the 49ers. 49ers would make a good play, you know, that seemed to be fairly effective, and he'd say, kill him, kill him, lucky, lucky. And, and, and then when they, his team would do a good play, look at that beautiful play, that's magnificent, oh, that, look at that skill. And he would really make so many noises that pretty soon I got to say, by God, I'd kick him out of here. I don't even like to have him around. <laughs> he gets everybody infuriated, this, this kind of fan. They got him in Philadelphia, the Quaker city, too. Worst place. <laughs> but it's the gaps, the gaposis, that's, I think, the most problem on the planet, between the haves and the have-nots. And I think if we don't get that problem solved, we're going to be wiped out. Because somehow the guy that doesn't have it hasn't much to lose by taking a shot at the guy that's got it. Whether it's a man out of the ghetto. I've talked to people out of the ghetto, some of these black kids who will rob people. And they really believe that they're entitled to anything they get. You owe it to me. If I steal a car and you arrest me for stealing a car, that is not justice. That isn't justice. I deserve that car. And how do you change that belief, or can you, when they really believe that? They stick up a man, and if you resist and are violent, <laughs> that's your problem, not mine, because I deserve that money that I got from you. And I have some black patients that have been sent to me because uh, they're right out of jail. And boy, are they tough to influence. Some real bad guys. And I try to intervene and head them off of becoming a dead black out in the gutter with their guts open. One of my patients, he's a beautiful guy. He's about six foot four, very elegant looking guy. But he, he is so arrogant, in fact, when I talked to him, he uh, came into my office and he sort of walked up to the window and stood there like this, like, you know, what am I? doing here, court order, but who cares? And uh, he wears a hat all the time. He wears fire engine red pants and very duty shoes, very high style. So uh, I think the second time he came in, as he walked up there, I says, you look like a goddamn pimp. Well, now, some people would say that's not a good way to start. <laughs> But it broke the ice for us, <laughs> and then we got talking about things. But the question I asked him, I said, do you get beat up? Do you get beat up very often in jail? He said, I get beat up every day. I said, well, you know, 
the way you dress, I happen to know some jailers that would interpret your dress and come on. They would say, you are asking to be beat up. Is that the message you're sending? Nope. Well, he dresses and comes on in his behavior in a way that that's the way people interpret him. It isn't the message he wants to send, but that's the message people are getting. And they feel perfectly justified in beating up on him, and he can't see why people beat up on him. Of course, that was my job, try to get him aware that he's, he's a partial author of the, some of the things he's not liking. Like I was a partial author of the insults I got by coming on stage two fashion a while ago. Well, let's get on with our, our gimmick here. I want to talk about deviation from the norm. Well, I better do something else first, a quickie. Uh, let's go to the, the top of page two. I better give you a quickie on that, and then we'll go to that, because I want to get into the talk pattern so we'll have some time to... We got to 11.30, huh? Let's get on with this. I want to do this in rather quickly, this model. This is what we call a sanity spectrum. It's a little <coughs> psychogram that tries to deal with stages one, two, three, and four in terms of a theoretical distribution of the adults that you are going to run into. Eight out of ten of the people that you're going to run into, I'm judging, are at stage two or stage three the absolutists and relativists, the pre-science, the early science people. We call these the traditionalists. We call these the revisionists. And you'll find about that proportion in almost every organization, any place in the world. The traditionalists make up the majority over the revisionists. The traditionalists say, don't change things. Keep them the way they were. The revisionists say we got to change things to meet the problems of the era. You'll find it in the Catholic Church. The traditionalists are saying don't change things. The Pope has the final word, and he does not have to consult his bishops on controversial matters. We are not a parliamentary organization. And the revisionists say, look, we got to get with some of the major issues, and we'd like to be consulted about some of these things. We'd like to have some say-so, say the bishops and say the clergy right down the line. We want to have some say-so. We want to decide if we want to marry or not. We'd like to have some say-so in our own destiny. The revisionists are saying this. In the most recent synod of bishops in Rome, they brought in a whole bunch of traditionalists from Spain to sort of pack the cards. <laughs> and you should hear the name-calling of the traditionalists and revisionists. Heretics. Heretics, we ought to burn them at the stake. Listen to them talk to one another. It's real, like children and, and youth, you know, having the battle. Heavy stuff going on, all in the name of one branch of the house. But the traditionalists pre predominate. You find the same thing in the Communist Party. The traditionalists in the Communist Party say, keep it closed. We can't allow too much information to circulate. The revisionist, like Czechoslovakia, says, open things up a little bit. We're going to be all right. Trade with the West and so on and so on. And of course, when they get a little confrontation, the traditionalists dusted off Stalin, came in with their tanks, and here we go again. And now they're trying to get the, 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 the Czechs to acknowledge and state that Russia saved them. And the Czechs I know say, go to hell. Only, of course, they can't say that publicly. But they're doing a lot of sabotage and a lot of things in the background. As I say, we're not going to be pushed around by the traditionalists. But you can go, you see, the, the revisionists are saying, we want to have some say-so down the line in terms of authority. The traditionalists say, we're going to do it the way we've been doing it. And you go to any campus, you go to this campus, and watch any confrontation. And what are the kids saying? We think the courses are irrelevant to the issues of the era. And so they go to the administration and say, we'd like to do something about it. And the traditionalists say, <clears throat> in due time. 
And the revisionists say, we want it now. And the traditionists say, are you threatening me? And the revisionist says, call it what you want. We want action now. We're tired of this stalling. And so we get a confrontation. And if you know a faculty, they're more stage two people in the faculty probably than any place else. You know, they've been teaching the same course for 40 years. I don't know, I haven't changed anything. And ever talk to a, to a faculty man and say, the course I give is the most important course in the whole university. And you say, rubbish. And of course he doesn't like that, so, you know, standard stuff. This is what the American Revolution was all about. We want to have some say-so in our own destiny. This is what the whole world revolution is still about. We want to have some say-so in the decision-making process. And it is worldwide. It is worldwide. There's no place on the planet. And the kids, of course, at the youth level, this is a natural development where they're fighting the establishment anyway, here, at the youth level. But this is what it's all about. Same thing the American Revolution was about. Want to have a say so. And the management revolution that I've been involved in for 15, 20 years now, we've been doing this right down the line. We try to get as much decision making power as far down the line as we can. We want the last guy in the row in the pecking order to have some say so in his own job. And of course, that's revolutionary. And when we talk, we'll talk about the way these people talk because these people are talking in ways that are really going to make things get worse. And we'll talk about this way of talking out here. But think of any school board in the country, think of any city council in the country, think of any organization in the country, and you'll find the traditionalists and the revisionists are at loggerheads. The traditionalists saying, slow it down. The revisionists saying, speed it up. And they're in a big, big deadly thing. We call these people, by the way, in terms of sanity, if you are as naive as an isolated man, but living in a complex culture as an adult, you are as limited in handling conversational exchanges as an infant. We call you insane. About 10% of us are that hung up. Some of us are in institutions, but some of us are just wandering around the streets. Some of you may work around here. I don't know, maybe you know some. Then we have lumped together these people, stage two, stage three. We call them the authoritarians. They're like children and youth in terms of their assumptions, the absolutists, the relativists. We lump these together and we call them simply unsane, just normal people. And the people talking like unsane people, I'll now demonstrate as soon as I get this spread out. This is the modern science group, the ones we call adults, and these we call the sane ones, about 10%. And I'm going to tell you how these people talk. Now turn your page over to page three. And I have taken that same thing and I've done this with it. I've made this into a normal distribution curve. And then I put a line through here. I call this the line of comparative innocence because what I'm saying is people who talk and behave in these ways do so as a defense against their sensitivity they carry from their infancy. And it's a hyperexic. It's hyperexic talk. It makes things get worse. These are the people who come out very strong and say, that's the way it is. I'm telling it like it is. They come on like children or parents, and not like an adult. Now notice that if you look at that scheme, then I've taken the scale. I put one, two, three, four, five, six right on that thing. See where that one, two, three, four, five, six is? And then I turn right around and put that thing over here. And I cut it off like that. So you can see one, two, three, four, five, six. And these will now represent 
the talk patterns of people at stage two and three in here. This will represent the talk patterns of people at stage four. You got, did I swing that around so it fell apart or are you still with it? Because I want to talk about these kinds of talk patterns, which I guarantee are going to be hyperexic. If you're talking in these ways, things are going to get worse and everybody's got a perfect case. If you talk in these ways, there's a possibility that things may get better. This is a therapeutic dialogue. And I'll show you what these are now. Whoop. I said I wanted to talk about, touch on deviation. Whenever we deal with people who don't fit in a culture, we have a model for treating them, for dealing with them. If you're at stage one, we call it the demon model because the basic assumption is if you're an unusual guy, you got evil spirits pushing you around. The gremlins have got you. And you, you know what you do for treatment? You go to the witch doctor who does his mumbo jumbo. And you may get well. Because when the mumbo jumbo goes on, you're again in a trance state. And if you're in a trance state, if you're a deep enough trance state, we can actually influence tissue. When we get you into a very deep trance, I can get you in such a deep trance that when I touch this to your wrist, I'll say, this is a very hot rod. And I touch your wrist there, and you get a real blister. Maybe some of you have seen that happen. A real blister comes up right there. And there wasn't anything there but that chalk. But your body takes that as a literal message, and you do the things to repair the damage that you know is created because there's damage created by your own belief system. If you really are getting people influenced by brain mechanisms, you see, you can influence the tissue. And in a similar way, you can get well. It's unbelievable what power we have. And that's why so many belief systems are so effective because you get well. You get better when you're in a trance and somebody, somebody gets a message to you. I talked to a bunch of uh, Tweedy pipe smoking physicians in Monterey Peninsula the other day, about a hundred of them, and uh, I told them that medicine in the 70s, as I see it, medicine in the 70s is not only keeping up with the technological stuff that's coming on, but the big thing is going to be a physician talking to a patient to mobilize his health potential. And that takes a very new skill that most physicians don't know. Most people give you a placebo and say, you're going to be all right, George, you know, or Charlotte. And sure enough, you begin to get better. You know? a, lot of, a lot of suggestion goes in medicine now. But you have a tremendous health potential if somebody knows how to tap it. And it's just a matter of talking to you. And I say, that'll be the big development in the 70s is getting physicians to be more effective in tapping the health potential. The demon model at stage one. Stage two we call it the, the sin model, the legal model. The legal model says you shape up or we have to punish you. You're a bad guy. We take the problem of drinking. It's demon rum at stage one. The demons will get you. At stage two we put you in jail for drinking. In Los Angeles recently they've shifted from what they call the legal model to what we call the medical model which means you're sick. And Los Angeles is having a lot of trouble, at least so I understand, that you had 5,000 men and women in jail and you know they don't have 5,000 beds to put them in bed when they're sick. But those alcoholics now have been reclassified as sick and they're going in, they're filling up all the beds. And other people can't get in. And the alcoholic, he's just sitting back saying, ah, uh, well, you called me sick, God damn it, you make me well. <laughs> and of course, they're not succeeding. Let's get across the border. But this is where the warfare again is. If you go to your current 
courts of justice, you'll listen to the behavioral scientists, especially the, the, the psychiatrists and the legal people talking. And the question is, who's boss? And the legal says, man, we're the men that got the robe, you know? We're the judge. We're the power. And the psychiatrist says, you guys are obsolete. You don't know what you're talking about. He turns to the judge and says, can you determine if this man had choice or not in his behavior? Are you that sophisticated and knowledgeable? And the judge says, God damn it, you arrogant bastard. Get out of my court. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the judge here. And there's a warfare. The absolutists, the relativists, the pre-science, the early science people, it's going on all over, everywhere. The traditionalists, the revisionists. But we're across the border. We're at what we call a human effectiveness model. And my job as a psychotherapist is to tap your human effectiveness potential. How you doing? I talk to you as a man who's an alcoholic, and we find out every alcoholic's hung up in some way. And I say, how you doing? It's pretty tough. Yeah. Uh, is your condition modifiable or unmodifiable? In other words, do you have any choice over your behavior or are you beyond the point of return? But I can't determine that, but I can find out and together we may find out if you can determine it. But I don't treat you like a guy that's pathological or just a bad guy. I treat you as a human that maybe got hung up in some way. Something you're trying to work through, maybe never got worked through. And let's see if we can tap that potential in you. And that's, my, that's what we're trying to do now as behavioral scientists. And we've got to talk in ways that tap that effectiveness potential. That's why I say that's the medicine of the 70s. Tapping your human effectiveness potential if I'm a friend of yours, or if I'm a physician, tapping your health potential so that you function better within the organism. Well, now let's see how these people talk. We call this the sad syndrome because we're saying it's sad because you get worse. Now, the man at the top of the scale is a cop-out. Comes a crisis and he has what we call sullen silence. He ignores. He withdraws. The man up here, <clears throat> suppose he said, I'm for law and order, and the other man says, you're a racist. Now most men, when somebody calls him a racist, and he's a big guy, and he's a tough guy, most people don't say anything the next round. They just pass. And the question is, if you don't say anything back to me after I've told it like it is, how do you suppose I interpret your silence? I interpret your silence to mean, drop dead, I'm going to pretend you're not there. Silence is the most deadly weapon we have. Silence can kill. And it kills because of the interpreter taking it as a wipeout. You haven't anything relevant to say. The thing that caused more damage with my friend Don Hayakawa who's a neighbor of mine. We walk together once in a while and eat together once in a while to try to, you know, check in on what his world's like these days. But probably the biggest boo-boo he did in the beginning was to walk out on the convocation that was set. He just shut it down. And there's nothing that'll infuriate people more. He had a whole lot of potential allies and he just cut them off. He said, ah, oh, that's, a, that's a bull session. That's a bull session. Now you see, if I have called a convocation to talk, and I'm a faculty and you're a student, or vice versa, and we think we've got a dialogue going, and somebody comes along and says, no, you haven't got anything to say. There's nothing going to wipe us out more than that. Don, I've seen him walk out on a meeting where he didn't think things were going right. And he, when he walked out, I said, Don, you made your biggest boo-boo when you walked out of the meeting when you had that meeting with the blacks, when you walked out. There's nothing more insulting. And I said, why did you walk out? He said, they didn't have anything relevant to say. Now, how do you like that? I said, well, you better come back and take another course in semantics. 
But he hasn't been back yet. But he, he's, a, he's a very difficult man to give negative feedback. Because, you know, he's authority. He's the big daddy that knows all about semantics. You better, you better take a refresher course. Well, these are the anger inners, the alcoholics, very sensitive people, they easily wiped out. You just clam up. You know, ulcers and so on, but, uh, but very vulnerable. Now, the anger outers attack in a crisis. They're right next door. They come on with judgments and advice. That's the name calling when you're at the child level. That's the diagnosing everybody when you're a little more sophisticated. Calling people sick. Why, oh, you're sick? God damn it. That's the trouble with you. Most people are coming on this way. By the way, if you, it, it, let's take one third one here. These are the ones who are the frauds. They deceive in a crisis. They make jokes, use sarcasm, apologize, and so on. We call these people the frauds. Now, if you look at the black scene again, in America for hundreds of years, the black man has been playing two games. He's been a cop out with the blues. And he's been playing Uncle Tom. And he alternates between Uncle Tom and the blues. Silent. Sullen silence and the blues. That is sullen silence and, and the, uh, the Uncle Tom stuff. Now, the Uncle Tom stuff is where if you try to talk seriously with a black man, at least of my generation and even younger, they'll, they, they will never talk about anything seriously. They'll always smile and say, ah, yeah, that's certainly, that's right. Ah, you bet you. Ah, that's so, that, uh, you know, by God, I can't get a serious conversation going. But that's their, that's the game. Sort of the Uncle Tom, always showing their teeth and being friendly and making a joke out of everything that happens. Or else they're sitting there, you know, with the blues. I mean, it's a real deep thing. Now they've become, you see, they've moved. The modern black man has moved from the sullen, silent man to what we call the anger outer. And he's telling it like it is. And he says these demands are non-negotiable. Well, that's going to be a little ripper right there. Because when somebody comes out and says the demands are non-negotiable, that's a, that's a real straight out stage two position and about all you can do is to hit him and then blame him because he's dead. And this is where we're finding the problem with, of it is that the black man who's come out with this anger outer stance, nobody knows how to talk to him. Nobody knows how to talk to him. Most of us, when a black man comes out strong, we just clam up, which is an absolute wipe out of him. Or we try to make a joke. Ha 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 Oh boy. And if we get tough, well, we bite the dust pretty fast because he's, he's been training, training himself maybe in street fighting and so on. But I, I wonder what you people do when you run into a vociferous, articulate black man who tells it like it is. I imagine most of you just sort of sit there with your teeth in your face get a little grumpy inside. How do you handle a man that says you're a racist? You're a racist. Now don't give me any of that Chinese lingo. <laughs> you're a racist! You want me to respond to that? Of course! God damn it, I'm giving it to you. You're a racist. Honky racist, the worst kind. He just laughs a little bit. Ha 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 huh? And you are too. Why do you feel that way? Oh, I've got to warn you about a why question. <laughs> a why question is above the line. It's a dirty word. Now I'll tell you why we call a why question a dirty word. Because the receiver decodes a why question as a judgment. Why do you feel that way? Why did you think that? You see, now it may not be, it may be a request for information. You see, this is where we get down across the line to inquiry. Inquiry, this is across the border now. You ask questions and get information. And you also shut up here. The silence of listening. Okay, which you've done pretty well this morning, see? 
This is sullen silence. This is observation listening silence. And I'm here to remind you, you can't tell one from the other by looking at people. You can look right at somebody and you say, my God, he's got the message. He's been playing golf all day. You can't tell by looking at people. You got to ask them. They, you may think they're listening, they're silent. You may think they're silent, they're listening. Because you most, all of you have beautiful cop-out expressions. You look like, you, know, you look like you're sort of interested and, you know, interesting. And, you know, and I don't know how many of you are here. Can't tell by looking at you. I could guess some of you just left right in the beginning when I first used a dirty word or something. Called somebody a bastard. For all I know, might have shut your whole set off for the whole day. <clears throat> Here's where we're getting down to the pay dirt now. But say, watch out for that why. Now this is where we're asking. We're trying to get you to be authentic about yourself. You know, how do you really feel about so and so and such and such? How did you feel when I used that expression, bastard? Well, the, that, this isn't one of your sensitive areas, huh? Well, in certain cases, yes, but I mean. Under the context, it was all right. Because yeah. you knew it was I kind of a game. Call me that. No, mm -hmm. but it was kind of like demonstrating rather than the mm -hmm. calling you something. Yeah. How, who felt uncomfortable about my Catholic come on, about doing all that monkey business? How many are Catholics? What, are you segregated all over here? Whether they keep to the left, is that right? <laughs> are you a traditionalist Catholic? Or are you? Uh, no, no. You're a revisionist type, huh? Uh, I'm neither. You're not even a good Catholic, huh? <laughs> no, I'm not a good Catholic. Not a good Catholic. <laughs> Any Mormons in the house? Did anybody feel uncomfortable when I was talking about that, that doing that thing about the jawbone? Didn't bother anybody? Bothered you? Huh? Yeah, I, I would say it did. That didn't yeah. bother me. Well, just like yeah, one. I think you had the wrong impression. Yeah, probably going to alienate people, and you were a little uncomfortable, but for, for me, maybe. Yeah. Didn't bother you, any, But you're a little uncomfortable for me, because I might be alienating people. What do you think about my talking about a black man? Well, one point, it seems like it didn't make something. The in between? Yeah, that, you know, the guy was playing two parts, you know. And he didn't say he didn't lie, he was playing two parts. The other time, and he had Oh, yeah, yeah. So you needed a little more clarification, it's all. But it yeah, did, nothing I said particularly got. Well, it kind of got to me because you didn't explain it. You know, yeah, you know, sort of like I just flipped it out and didn't say anything more. Right. Sort of left you a well, little you waiting. Left everyone, you know, yeah. Waiting, you know. Yeah. Okay. Have I said anything that offended you? Well, I'm not offended. You're not offended? No. We still love each other, huh? Of course. Because I'm the fair, honest one. You're the open, honest one? Right. Yeah. And you like open, honest people. But how did you think about that guy down there who said he didn't sure about being a Christian? Well, he explained to me why he said it. Oh. He illustrated outside. And so then I you felt all right about him? Right. Yeah, that's nice. Other, up to that point, you're a little wondering about that guy, huh? I was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, if you watch the chain that I've been using here, I have been making what I call creative translations, which means I speculate about you. About you or your message or your motive or whatever it is. And that's what we call the core of therapeutic dialogue. Five is to be authentic about me. Six is to translate your message. Now let me show you how I do that. Let's take, see I've got to have both those ingredients in a therapeutic dialogue. I've got to acknowledge, and maybe this is about, if I go by, this is about one-fourth of my message and this is three-fourths of my message. I really have to tap my own gut 
when a message comes in. Let's take the one that says, you're a racist. Well, now, if that comes in pretty heavy for me, I say, oop, oh my God, you got the message right through. That really got to me. See, I'm tapping my, acknowledging my own emotion. Then I say, and if I read you right, when somebody says law and order, as far as you're concerned, that means putting down the blacks. Is that it? And he says, by God, that's right. I was doing this with every one of you a while ago. I've, I translated back your message, and every one of you did something. I wonder if you noticed what it was. You nodded your head. Now, I watch for the nod of the head because that shows you, you sense I, was, I dug your message. And that law of reciprocation comes alive. When you sense I understand you, you're in debt to understand me. The Quakers say, thee becomes beholden to me. And my job as a psychotherapist is to put you in my debt for a purpose. And the purpose is so I can talk about myself, my biases, my preferences, my hang-ups or whatever. The key word is to understand, and I'm going to try to understand you, and I want you to understand me. Because that's where we begin to grow. Things begin to get better when we understand one another. This is the big bag of communication is trying to get on your wavelength. The, non the Rogerians do this sort of stuff in their non-directive uh, dialogue. But I think that Carl Rogers has never acknowledged how much this influences people when we begin to exchange relevant information this way. That the sender's message, once the understanding is going, the sender's message is having a terrific amount of impact on the receiver, both ways, when you're a sender originally or whether you're a sender in the chain. Because when we get a little understanding, see, I'm open now. If I've understood you, I get to talk about me. And then I keep going back and translating you and understanding me, and pretty soon you're doing the same thing. And once we get understanding each other, then we can take the whole new scene and say, now, where do we go from here? What do we want to do? And that's what uh, Vandy Water will talk about the rest of the day. I think a lot will be on, you know, how do we get together? How do we work things out? How do we recognize people that aren't and what ways we can deal with them? And I wanted to show you this person-to-person -person therapeutic dialogue. And this becomes a substitute for this kind of stuff. It's as simple as this, if we want to put it in another form. We'll take Eric Burns' chart, transpose it a little bit, call this the child, the parent, and the adult. Now the child and the parent are on a big kick as to who's boss. I tell you as the parent, this is where Spiro Agnew made his big boo-boo as I read it. When he talked to the communications media, he told them that they were doing bad things. And they reacted just like children, or maybe more like parents saying, look, who do you think you're talking to? We're the press. And they said, we're the boss. Veto to you. Don't tell us how to run our business. They interpreted it like he's coming on like he's the big father. And so they reacted like they're putting him down. Let's see how Spiro Agnew might have done this if he'd have been an adult about it. This is the way I would have approached. I'm upset by what happened. That Nixon gives his Vietnam speech and then the commentators come on with all their comments before it gets the time to soak in. That's the way Spiro and, and uh, probably Nixon and a lot of other people felt. You know, give, it, give the message a chance to soak in a little before you start all the editorializing and commenting and saying it didn't agree, somebody was disappointed and blah, 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 blah. So let's see how I handle this. If I weren't too upset, I wouldn't say anything to begin with about my own position. Or if, I'm, if I am upset, I'd say, I'd start talking about me. I found myself reacting kind of uncomfortably 
the other day after Nixon's speech. I was getting, found myself getting some negative reactions. Now, I want to ask you as the, as the press, I want to ask you a question. Is the press beyond, above and beyond criticism? Of course not. Now, he says, of course not. And I say, I'm glad to hear that. Now, the question I want to ask you is, how do I go about giving you negative feedback if I have some? Now, the reason I asked that question there, you see, I said, I want him to participate in the solution. How do I give you negative feedback? You've already said that you'll accept negative feedback. Now, I have to ask you how I can give you negative feedback. I don't tell you. I ask you. Down here, we consult one another instead of telling. We're open about ourselves as we go along. And this is the key. I've got to be open as I consult you. If something jars me, I've got to let you know about that, but I want to consult you about the position. And I have an idea that the press would have said, well, that's a good question. We'll, we'll have to see a work about that. What was it? And they'll probably turn around and say, what was it that, that, that got you the most upset? And then I'll say, well, I'll tell you what shook me up was the immediacy of the commentators after Nixon came on with his speech. And they'll say, well, they'll probably start to explain it. And they'll say, well, I'll tell you how it happened. We knew so long in advance about it that a lot of us had some kind of expectation. And a lot of us were expressing our approval, disapproval, our disappointment, you know, whatever. And we'd learn about that. And then we might work something out after a while because we've both gotten our guts a little bit open. Well, this is what we're attempting to show people, the core of a therapeutic dialogue, because it begins to open things up again. Let me show you, though, in an old corny example, how this works in reality. Let's take a situation where we're driving out on the freeway here, and it's one of those foggy mornings, as it was yesterday morning and the day before. And we're going along, but being very, very careful at the top speed, but we're just, you know, doing what we, a lot of caution. Maybe we're slowed down to about 55 because it's pretty foggy and we can't see very far and it's pretty jammed up. Along comes somebody going about 90 and he is zooming and zooming and cutting in and as he goes by and you're driving and I'm sitting next to you, he goes by and he almost gets your left fender and I say, how'd you feel about that guy? What are you going to say? Well, first reaction would be something like you turkey or something like that. You turkey! <laughs> you turkey. Now that's a new one. <laughs> what are you going to say? He's a crazy fool. You can say something in Chinese? <laughs> no, it'd be kind of vulgar. Well, what are you, well, you going to say? I'm going to say, now, how'd you feel? Look at that crazy son of a bitch. Look at that crazy son of a bitch. What are you going to say? I'd probably say the same thing. <laughs> Another crazy son of a bitch. What about you? What are you going to say? I'm sitting next to you. You're driving. Probably because I'd be so scared. Phew. And then what are you going to say? Probably damn. Damn. <laughs> what are you going to say? Glad to see him go. What are you going to say? Probably, what the hell? What the hell? Damn fool. Damn fool. Idiot. Idiot. <laughs> scared. scared. I'm scared? Well, there's an unusual response. What are you going to say? Honestly, I'll say what I've said many times. Yeah. Gosh, thank you, Jesus. Huh? I'd say, golly. Golly? Yeah, and then I'd say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I didn't get involved. I really did. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Oh, the deity came in, plucked you right out of the, well, right know, out of hell, huh? I mean, I know you. You probably want to understand, but that's exactly what I would do, and I'm, this is honest. You don't think I'm? I understand that position. Well, I don't know, do you? Well, I read in your tone of voice that you don't think I really appreciate well, that I kind of oath. It, well, I'll, I'll rephrase it. I hope you understand. Okay. Because that's really what I would say. Okay. Now, 
I want to get down to what happened, though. Notice that when I asked you how you felt about that guy, that almost nobody, this man, the only one said, somebody said, you, and you said, I'm scared. The only people that talked about themselves. Everybody else, when I asked you how you felt about that situation, you talked about him. Every one of you either made a judgment or gave advice. Well, he was. He was stupid. He was stupid. Anybody that tried like that on He's stupid. Night? That's right. <laughs> eh? He's a stupid man. So that's a, that's a judgment. Eh? And of course, she repeats it. He was a stupid man. <laughs> it sounds like most women. They're stage two. You know? <laughs> uh, when we do a careful study, by the way, we find most women are stage two. That's my judgment. And that the average man, there's a sort of an overlap. If we did a central tendency, we'd find it something like this. That the average man is stage three. The average man is much more relativistic. they will say, well, or Jimmy's way, Charlotte's way, we'll do it my way. <laughs> now, not that it's really right, but just because I say so. The man wants to be the papa and have veto. He wants to be the boss. But the, the stage two woman says, but you know that's really wrong. Because to her, right and wrong, he really is stupid. He really is stupid. Notice he's, she even used the word really. That's a stage two reality. Really is stupid. Now, on the intuitive level, we find women, women are more at stage four than men. They have some sort of intuition about, about, you know, things. I don't know why it is, but the difficulty comes when they open their mouths. <laughs> <laughs> because they are not, they're not as sophisticated in logic. They're not, they don't take the relativistic position. They take a very, they're very, you'll find a women are very identified with their feelings. They say, oh, oh, I feel something very deeply. I feel you don't love me. You say, what the hell, I do too. Don't lie. <laughs> we had a, I told the people up at Silomar about the lady who had, <clears throat> had some sort of a thing with her husband. And he came in and he said, well, he said it was kind of strange. I went home and uh, she'd fixed some pickles that day. So I took a bite and I said, they're soft. And she started to cry. <laughs> and I said, what's the matter? She says, you don't love me. I said, what do you mean? Love me, love my pickles. Now, women are very identified with their products. <laughs> if you don't love my product, you don't love me. Now, women are very much that way. Men are less identified with their products. They're a little bit more open in their logic, a little more relativistic. Women are very stage two logic. They make a statement. They say, I've been thinking about this for a long time, and I feel it very deeply. Kaboom! He's stupid. He really is stupid. And they somehow think they... Now, now let's take the, the one I was suggesting now. Here, let's go back to that drive, going up the freeway, and I'm driving, and my wife is sitting next to me. The man went along through that fog like, Choo! and I said, idiot! Might say, goddamn idiot, but usually not quoting somebody. You know, I just say, idiot. <laughs> idiot! Huh? And my wife, you know, she's one of these, what we call a rescue. She's a Red Cross type, you know, the rescue. So she looks at that car that just went, and she says, why, that's no idiot, that's Harry. <laughs> and you know what I say next? Harry is an idiot. <laughs> and of course, I wipe her out for about three days. <laughs> She won't even let me get in the Japanese bath we just built. <laughs> now this is the way it is. Now I want to show you how come, because I don't like even the why. This happens. When I take a position and make a judgment, although in actuality I make judgments because I'm upset usually. When I'm upset, if you're a man, most men 
make judgments as naturally as they breathe. Most women, I find, tend to give advice automatically. <laughs> women, when somebody goes around like that, they say, he ought to look where he's going. He ought to be arrested or something like that. Men usually say, God damn fool. Now, the, posi the, the point is, if I've taken a position and somebody else takes another position, I interpret this as a wipeout. If I take a position, somebody silence. I interpret the silence as a wipeout, invalidation. If I take it, make a judgment. Somebody else gives a judgment, counter judgment or advice. I interpret it again as a wipeout of my position. So all I can do is reassert my own position and wipe you out. If I've taken a position and you make a joke out of it, when I'm trying to be serious, I interpret this as trying to put me down. So I'll come back and wipe you out. This is why we find so much goes on on this level that's destructive. It's because of the receiver translating the message as a wipeout. It may not even be intended as a wipeout, but the translator makes of it. Let's show you a simple one. Let's take an insane lady at one of the state hospitals. She makes a statement, four plus four equals eight. Now this lady had had a fight the morning before I got there. And I was to interview her for the staff. And so I simply said, well, what happened? She said, I told Charlotte that four and four make eight. And Charlotte said, six plus two equals eight. <laughs> now why in the hell did she hit her? Because she interpreted with her very limited skills and vulnerability that this was a wipeout of her position. And we don't like to be invalidated. You're telling me I'm crazy. When you, you see, I interpret you're telling me I'm wrong. And this is what we're doing up here in this idiot, not an idiot. And you'll find that this is so characteristic of everybody who's talking on the whole planet today. If you listen to the Black Panthers after the police came in the other day and listen to the interpretations of the motives of the police and listen to the interpretations of the police about the Black Panthers, listen to the Jews and the Arabs and listen to them translating one another's position, listen to the North Koreans and South Koreans, listen to the United States and Paris, listen any place on the planet and you find accusations, tr mistranslations, interpretations and told just like they did it just to upset us. And the other guy says, well, that's ridiculous. Are you saying my position was ridiculous? And then we're going to get into compound fracturing all over the place. This is what the vice president's doing. This is what the press did. The press position after the vice president's statement sounded to me so ludicrous, it sounded as if they hadn't heard the message, as if they hadn't read it at all. They just came out real goofy, in my estimation. It sounded like a little child that had just been hit by mother and the little child is saying you're a nasty 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 to hit me you're an unfair uncouth mother that's the way it sounded to me and they sounded like trying to be adults and they sounded like little kids saying you're a nasty and of course I imagine Agnew just thought it was kind of ridiculous their position and he'd say, oh, those guys just didn't understand the message. <laughs> and so he'd probably say so again. And of course, they're going to get into all this heavy stuff. Well, this is what the name of the game is. How do I talk as one adult to another adult? I consult you, and I'm open about me. And the key is to keep my own gut open. Acknowledge when I'm jarred, and then try to get to you to find out where you're at, as we say find out what's with you. And that's where we build up reciprocity. Hey, by gosh, time has gone away. That's not what I intended to do. I didn't want to take so much time being a sender. I wanted to get into your stuff this morning. <coughs> Who's got a, a fresh little problem where somebody had a confrontation with you over something? Got a quick example. I like to take these little critical incidents and then show you how we handle them. 
up here, doing this instead of these things. You got one? Yeah. Yeah, we had a conversation last evening with a member of our staff and three black students who uh, were friends of a person who lived in the residence hall. Yep. And um, can you hear him? No. Turn up your sending set a little, would you? And you may be aware that this is final exam time, and there's yeah. a lot of tension. A little tension, so build up. And there also have to be quiet hours for the whole time, 22-hour quiet hours. And uh, these three uh, black students were making quite a bit of noise. And uh, the staff member came down and told them to quiet down or leave, and there was a confrontation. Papa telling the children to hush, 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 children. Remember the rules. Huh? And that's the way they. That's the way they looked at it. Like you know, some authority was telling them. Sure. And what did they say? They reacted, uh, you know, kind of angry, like you know, kind of forced a confrontation, were physical about it. Drop dead. Look, don't push me around. Right. Pretty much like that. Yeah. So they said, don't push me around. They said, who's the boss around here? I'm the boss. Don't talk to me like a child. I'm not a child. I'm, a, I'm an adult. Huh? And then uh, another person uh, entered the scene on behalf of the staff member. An interventionist. <laughs> Who was uh, of comparable size to the three students. They were, they were quite large, and the staff member was quite small. And, uh, Unfair. Unethical. Right. Goddamn blacks. So that even made it kind of hotter because they were more willing to... Uh, Going to take on the big guy. Right. That was more fair. Well, you know what You know what, what the original papa said. He said, my daddy will come in and help. Huh? Now we're ready. We'll take you on. Huh? And the black said, boy, this is an opportunity. Let's go. Huh? Okay. So the staff member called for the assistance of their friend who lived there and told asked him if he would tell them, you know, explain to them what the situation was, yeah. and, you know, take them into the room and talk to them. Yeah, explain it to them. Now, children, I'll herd you in here, eh? and I'll give you the word. Huh? I want to be a good mama. Hmm? So that took care of it for a while, and then when they... What, you remember what that fella said? What fella? The big fella. From no, no, I don't. Remember what he I said? Didn't get comments on that. Yeah. Um, so when they left, they were making noise on the way out again, and the staff member just happened to be walking down the hall. They were dribbling a basketball or something. Yeah. And uh, warned them again, and this time escorted them. And, uh, they did Is this the big fella? Uh, or the little fella? The staff member only this time. Staff member? Yeah, he's the little guy. Right. Okay. And um, as he was talking to them, they were going down the elevator, and he wasn't finished talking with them. And uh, they finished it for him, kind of gave him a little shove. Here and there and stuff like that. Yeah. I wonder how the black man feels about that whitey now. <coughs> uh, right now. Probably the same way that he felt before. Yeah. I wonder how that whitey feels about the black man now. Those arrogant goddamn niggers. One day we'll have our day of reconciliation. Huh? Oh. I wonder if somebody had been able to say, hey, what's cooking? And these, maybe the black man says, this guy's been pushing us around. He's been pushing around. He thinks he owns this place, and he's trying to set down the rule like Big Daddy. And just imagine that guy is on the receiving end of that, and he says, he says uh, it really got you pretty uptight. He's coming on pretty arrogantly. And they'd probably say, you're goddamn right. And he's got to knock that stuff off. And so I'd say, and if I read you right, the sooner he knocks off pushing you around, the sooner you'll shape up and kind of observe the house rules. Huh? And they'll probably say, well, we may and we may not. And I'll say, actually, you want to decide whether you want to make noise and, and without any intervention from us. You think you're a pretty good judge of whether you're making racket or not. And he says, I think that's right. We ought to be able to decide that ourselves. Well, I'd want to find out, uh, how do you feel when somebody makes racket when you're studying? Doesn't bother us at all. 
well, I might just keep this up until I find out, you see, that they're saying, if it doesn't bother us, why should it bother you? And we ought to have that much liberty around here. Otherwise, we feel we're being oppressed. But if I get into a good dialogue with them, I think pretty soon they'd say, hey, that's not a bad guy. And we think his rules are kind of stupid. But you know, he's a pretty good guy. He treats us like a human being. He treats us like an adult, not like a big papa. And maybe I can even uh, observe something he said I think is ridiculous. And he'll probably end up saying, I think it's kind of ridiculous that we have to do that. But you know, you're a pretty good guy, and I, I think I'll, I'll go along. Because I think there's a possibility, number one, I want to solve the problem, and number two, I want to preserve the integrity of people involved in the problem. And I think that if you learn how to talk like an adult to another adult, you can bo do both those things. You can preserve your integrity and you can solve the problem. But I want you to know that almost everybody in a slight crisis whoosh, tends to jump right up. And it's natural as breathing. And I'm saying, I don't want you suddenly to become therapist, but I think you ought to recognize that there are some things you can do in a crisis that tend to neutralize crisis instead of make it better and then play the blame game. And that requires, that entails being authentic about me and trying to understand your position. And I keep that up until pretty soon you say, hey, I think you're, we're on the same wavelength. And then we can decide where we want to go. It's a skill anybody can learn, but it's difficult. But you can use this at any time. You can have a big confrontation. And then after the confrontation, you suddenly say, you say, hey, how are we doing? I go back and say, how are we doing? How would you feel when I wiped you out a while ago? You see, I go back and, and talk about it. I don't apologize, because apologizing, you see, is interpreted as a phony. I may mean the apology, but if it's interpreted, may interpret it as a phony. So I just say, how are we doing? And I'll try to get some little statement from you, and I say, by gosh, it really shook the hell out of me. But I took it. What you tried to do was this. You thought that was a fair thing to do. And he'll say, yeah, I sure did. And I thought your position was most unfair. And I'd say, gee, you really didn't like my, my position, especially after you'd stated yours. You just thought it was a perfect wipeout. He says, that's right. Now, there's a great danger in using this thing. I'd like to warn you about using this thing. If you are an adult inviting somebody to open up, it's like a mother, if I can give you an analogy. And I say to you, I want you to tell mother how you really feel. Now, most children, when they then get a chance to unload, are going to say something like this. You are the most horrible ogre that ever lived. <laughs> and of course, the mother at that point says, don't you ever say that to your mother. <laughs> eh? Now, this is what's going to happen. If you start talking to, uh, like an adult to an adult, the probability is they will not talk about themselves, just like you people didn't. You're going to have an avalanche of judgments and advice. And that's where you've got to learn how to handle that hot potato. Because if somebody says, you're the biggest ogre that ever lived, then I'd say, well, boy, that, that kind of shook me when you came out like that. And if I read the message, I really have been a pretty big disappointment and kind of squelched you as your mother, huh? And the child would say, that's right. And that's where the art comes. Because once you've invited them to open up, most people aren't going to open up like adults. They're going to open up like children <laughs> or a vetoing parent. And that's where you've got to know how to handle it. This is what happens to so many people. I've known endless confrontations where we have somebody finally say, why don't you tell me how you really feel about me? And then the person says, you are plain sick. <laughs> and they say, well, God damn it, I am what I am, so go to hell. <laughs> they say, well, God, you just asked me to open up, now you don't like it. What the hell's the matter? And then we're back in the soup again. I have some papers, and I think you've got some of them. And uh, didn't you get some of them in your notebooks? Oh, yeah. That other one. So uh, 
there's an additional paper that you don't have that you might like to send for, which, although it's partly duplicated in another one, you might write to Frank Fee, and he's at the University of California Extension in Berkeley, Berkeley 94720, and just say you want Pemberton's paper, the Pemberton paper that's called Talk Patterns of People in Crises, because that I've spelled out this therapeutic dialogue. Ask for this specific paper. Now here's another little thing that apparently they duplicated, I didn't know, but it's a little talk, it's a little thing on uh, 1 Corinthians. I translated, retranslated 1 Corinthians with modern language, and you can have a copy of that if you'd like. You know, though I speak with the language of plain men or men of wisdom, and have not love, I am more like the machines of automation. And I did that translation, talking about the importance of love. See what? When we get down here, we really are tapping one another's human effectiveness potential. By gosh, we hit a great big package of affection. Because we have a reservoir of, of affection, love in the broad sense, just like we have big packages of hate and guilt, anger and guilt. We got big packages we carry.